killing. <laughs> well, Pam, which way are you going? Left or right? Right. Ah, uh, that's too bad. Why? Well, because it was a 50-50 shot on whether you'd be going left or right. You see, we're both going left. You could have just as easily been going left, too, and if that was the case, it would have been a while before you started getting scared. But since you're going the other way, I'm afraid you're gonna have to start getting scared immediately. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Splattercast. I'm Dylan Newell. And I'm Luke Janesco. And yes, today we have the uh, long-awaited. We've uh, we've actually had this in the books for quite some time. I think we teased it a little bit when our some of our coverage with Prey earlier. Uh, we'll be covering Predator 2 today, so that's going to be a fun one, as you can uh, read from the title here. A uh, movie that uh, I think... In some circles, I think maybe a few years ago, could be considered overlooked or uh, given a little bit more guff than I think it deserves. Uh, but as yeah. of recently, has definitely seen a little bit more of a resurgence. This is legitimately one of them films where I know we joke about it on the podcast and you do see it a lot on Twitter where it's like, well, actually, you know, this is an actual really good film. You know, mm. it's especially, honestly, probably in... The last few months, I've noticed it even more uh, than we have even over a year ago. Yeah, no, I think you're right, because I do see a lot of posts on Twitter about Predator 2, um, especially with the lead up to Prey here. And I mean, we've been talking about it. I think it's a, a constant running joke on uh, the channel and Sunday Scaries in particular that we seem to bring up Prey all the time. We are recording this. We are about a week out from the film's release, so you'll definitely be getting some massive coverage from us for that. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we have quite uh, a lot of reviews starting to trickle in. No official like long form reviews, but uh, a lot of more impressions because they did premiere it at Comic Con, um, yeah. and they are relatively positive. A lot of people are saying that this is the best Predator film since the original. They say it doesn't top the original, but how could you? I mean, honestly, like at this point, like. It's, it's kind of like if they released another Jaws movie, it'd be like, you know, you're not going to top that one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or, you know, uh, anytime a Halloween movie comes out, it's like, is it going to beat the original? Probably not. But uh, yeah, I'm just excited that it does seem like we finally have a worthy sequel coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about it as well, where, you know, watching this one and then going back, watching the original Predator, and I think the quality in the original predator predator is in kind of the in its simplicity in a sense where it doesn't get too complicated it really focuses on that there and now and looking at prey i really feel like they went back into what made that original great uh changing the time period making that unique um and focusing more so on the story than anything else where um you know sometimes they i feel like they get in their own head sometimes when they're trying to tell a story and it kind of gets a little muddled. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's the beauty of the original. And I think they're bringing that over into prey. So at least from what I'm hearing. Um, so yeah, I'm yeah. very intrigued. I mean, yeah, I don't think it's going to top the original. I have actually seen um, a couple of articles titled why prey is better than predator. And I don't know, it, you know, and it's like, I feel like maybe that's just uh, a headline, you know, to, to get 
get Jack the clicks. Bait type of things. Uh, um, so, I mean, you know, everyone wants a hot take, you know what I mean? Be like, oh, okay, that's uh, that's a little much. So, you know, I didn't really, again, they didn't, I saw the, the headline. I didn't read it. I haven't seen Prey, so I can't really compare it. Um, I'm intrigued. I can't wait till it's finally, it finally drops. I will probably be up at midnight, uh, to watch it. Cause I, it's one, I'm so anticipating this, this film. Yeah. I might have to do that as well. We'll have to see what happens really when the release schedule is. Um, but I mean, we've seen a lot of surprises, uh, as of recently where things are getting dropped early. I could really hope that they do drop the, uh, sorry, I got my, my light for some reason just decided to, uh, Start falling over on me. Dylan is just messing around over there with his lighting. He just does I, I apologize. But as I was saying, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm excited for this. I think that this is definitely something that uh, gives me a lot of uh, promise. I, I love Dan Trachtenberg, especially his work on The Boys and 10 Cloverfield Lane. I think that, you know, the guy definitely has an eye for good content, good material. Uh, so far, he hasn't disappointed. So I think that if he can nail this, then uh, we are in really great hands. Um, and I'm curious to see where the franchise is going to go after this, because, you know, we uh, made it very public in our first trailer reaction that this was something that we talked about on an old by admission only episode when we had uh, covered the Predator itself. Um, we famously were not fans of that. I don't think many people were, but, um, we had actually, uh, discussed our own ideas for what we would do for a predator movie. Um, mine ended up coming more of like an AVP movie by the end of it, uh, a little more predator focused, but yours, I even like, I wanted to throw my script completely out because like your idea, which we won't give away fully just in case, you know, as aspiring filmmakers ourselves, we might get the chance to do it. We kind of give it all away right there, but you know, um, yours. We're about to take that episode down. Screw we might it. have to, um, but yours uh, set in a similar way of this one, not in the same setting, but a, a past setting. Same vein. Yes. And I think that that's a really cool and unique way to do it. It's kind of like, it's kind of the star Wars issue that a lot of people have. And I think predators had that issue too, um, is where it's like, why do we have this thing with such expansive lore and all of this, uh, this great stuff that you could do with it, but you just kind of keep throwing it into the same stuff. Like why, why can't we just see where we can go with it? Put this thing in different time periods, different places. I think with uh, predators, which I think is actually, a, um, you know, right now, probably the third best in the franchise, I would say, because for yeah. me, um, you know, not to give too much away. I mean, obviously I'm a fan of this one. We're covering it. Um, I'd say one, two, and then predators. And then you can kind of just throw the predator and the AVP movies. If you want to throw them in there, just wherever you want. Um, Cause I just think those movies just don't hold up, but yeah, I think that like, they really need to just focus up on what makes these characters special and just really put them in unique scenarios and just put them in different spots. You know, like it was cool to see an alien planet with some different predators, bringing those out of the lore that's been established through the dark horse comics and the video games over the years. Um, but yeah, I think like just, you know, you can do a lot with them. You can really like put people in interesting scenarios just by stripping away weapons or just by stripping away things in time. I mean, you could set it in modern day and I, I can still think you could do something really interesting and cool, but it just seems like whenever you do, nobody really knows what to do with it. Clearly yeah. with the predator, they, they just had no idea where they were going with this movie. You know, and just like, I'm excited to see what Dan Trachtenberg does. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where people say maybe this will recalibrate the franchise and, you know, bring back a gravitas to it. And do I think that, Dan Trachtenberg can do that with Prey. Absolutely 100%. It's a very unique take. It's different. But that doesn't mean, I feel, and this is coming from a huge Predator fan, that that is going to set the course for the franchise to become quality films. Because looking at it, um, when we look at the back of that original film, very simple, very, you know, took, took place in current time, didn't get too much into its own head. If we look at everything conceptually, uh, Predator 2, unique concept. He's in the city. It's different. Um, AVP, again, unique concept. In theory, alien taking on a predator. 
AVP Requiem, again, you, they made it unique from the first, uh, from AVP because we have a Pred Alien in that. Predators, very unique because we're on a different planet, m multiple Predators taking place in that one. The Predator, I will say, not very original. I think they try to get it on course. So that one, you know, is a strike. But just because we put them in unique settings, you also have to have that quality of a filmmaker. You can't just be getting through to the next film. And sometimes I do put that in the studio because as we're going to be talking about Predator 2 here, the budget was a very big issue in terms of quality, in terms of what we could get. And I think that's always been a battle um, in these films where it's like um, we need the Predator and, and that's probably the biggest requirement. We need the Predator and then almost character work becomes secondary. Um, so it's like I, I think that's a that's a big problem. We do need quality screenwriters and filmmakers in general to kind of get this this franchise on course and dan trachtenberg the he had that idea it's near and dear to his heart he's been wanting to work on this you can tell he's got a dog in this game he he really wants to make this work and i think it's going to work so it's like but just because he knocks this one out of the park doesn't mean we get a predator film from two years from now in a unique setting and, and studio gets his hands all over it and you know we it could be a strike. So it's like, you know, just because we get quality out of this one doesn't mean the next one. Because it's like, we look back at all these. I think I think Predator had a lot of unique concepts in almost every film as I went through. But it just did not work. Mm -hmm. No, I can agree with that. There, there have been some unique concepts. And I guess, you know, when I say that, I think, like, it was more of a broad strokes kind of thing when I say it. Because, yeah. like, I think that these movies do kind of tend to feel very samey after a while, especially when you get at the level of quality that you have with those AVP and uh, predator, the predator vibes kind of stuff. And even the predators to an extent or predators to an extent. I mean, like, you know, that they really did try to set themselves apart. They had a lot of cool stuff. I just feel like the movie kind of, and you know, not to turn this into a predators podcast, there is a moment, and I will have to go back and rewatch it. And I'm a defender of the film. I like the film a lot. But there is some moments in that movie where we just kind of sit for a while and we're not yeah. really progressing anything. And we have these cool predators, but they're more just set dressing in some set aspects where it's like, okay, this one's here to fight. We see that for a couple minutes. That's it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's not really like we're getting into, you know, which what I like about the first two films. And maybe it is the es essence of adding too many cooks in the kitchen, having too many predators, because what you get with the first film and this one and what I hope and what I'm hearing we're getting with Prey is you get time with the creature and our yep. characters and you really get to see how they operate and their and their moral codes, uh, their ethics, you know, all that. And that's really, I think, what sets Predator aside as far as, you know, a action horror icon you know what i yeah. mean where it's like they they have a moral code and everything and we're going to get into that because there's a lot of great stuff especially with the uh expansive lore that uh predator seems to have which you know is just one of those things again i think like you know i'm kind of finding a star wars parallel here where it's like you know star wars has had so much expansive lore so much old canon that they can pull from that they weren't for a while and now yeah. you can see that they are and I think that the franchise really needs to start doing that for Predator as well, because there's a lot of really great ideas already there and they can just kind of pull them, tailor them to their own, like what they need to do um, for their story. But like they need to just stop saying, you know, oh, let's just throw this off to the side. We're going to do our own thing because I don't think that helps anybody. And I yeah. don't think that that sets anything up because these are very fleshed out and unique creatures and i mean like i think that's why no matter how many times they fuck up this franchise i'll still go see a predator movie i'll still anticipate a predator movie because they are awesome i mean whenever the predator NECAs get announced like i don't have very many of them i have my jungle hunter back there i want my city hunter um and i want that one that we were talking about a couple sunday scaries ago the shaman. Um, the shaman yeah i think that looks great but i know that's yeah. a slippery slope for me because then i'll just be getting them all yeah. um but like yeah it's like they they are really unique and cool creatures with so much lore and backstory and i i think that that's really where 
you know, they need to keep it focused. Keep it focused on one predator versus our set of humans or one human yeah. that you can really flush out the two. And I think that's um, a kind of the the beauty of the the original. Um, they had the uh, the luxury, I guess, in a sense, where they didn't have that many masters to please in that first film, where it was just like, hey, we're making a creature feature. Did they think this was going to turn to a franchise? No. We're putting Arnie in, in another action movie where he's taking on an alien. We don't have a code of honor. I mean, yeah, he's not going to attack you if... But at that point, it's no sport. It's not really like, oh, you know, uh, it, he's acting in code of honor. He is looking as as a hunter. Um, there's no sport in that. Why would I waste my time? So it's like it, post Predator, we we got the comics. We got a, a, an expansive lore where it's like, and again, that's where I think people kind of get in their own heads when they're making this, where it's like, oh, we got to add this. We got to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. This would be a unique concept. That first film, damn, they didn't even have the 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 design. Of yeah, that's right. Predator. I just saw that too, before we started, I was flicking around on Facebook cause you had to step off camera for a minute. And I just saw the Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, original design, him sitting there looking all pissed off. Yep. When we cover the original predator on here, there is going to be so much to talk about because yeah. that, that whole thing is just such a great, not only a great classic film uh, that really changed cinema in a lot of ways, uh, but just a lot of that behind the scenes kind of stuff. Like, and uh, I actually saw something and I'll bring this up right now. It was another, another post. I think it was on Twitter. Uh, just someone kind of made a little picture post thing of just like, so apparently they talk about a character and I haven't seen predator in a little while. I'm going to be rewatching it. Of course, before prey, I might flip it on tonight after we record here, but uh, they talk about a, a, another soldier who goes by the name of Hopper. Is that, are you remembering that correctly? Yeah. Okay. So they talk about how, I guess he can get himself out of sticky situations and stuff like that. And it's kind of now coming back that we have Hopper from stranger things. Um, uh -huh. They both served in Vietnam kind of thing like that, where they're just they're They're kind of, it seems like it was a nice wink and a nod from the Duffer brothers uh, of saying, you know, this is that character or at least a reference to it, which I oh. thought was kind of neat and cute, you know, like, and I, you can really see just how deep predator in and of itself has affected uh, cinema going forward and just how people yeah. handle pop culture. Cause I mean, you know, I, I would say that predators and aliens are synonymous with, you know, Jason, Freddie, Michael Myers, you know, all these people, you can show somebody a picture of that and they're at least going to be familiar with it. Yeah. Well, you know, and I can say, um, me growing up, I own the VHS for Predator. So, I mean, I'm five years old watching Predator. Uh, I, I was a huge, I am a Arnold Schwarzenegger fan. Like, I grew up with him. He was one of my favorites, still is to this day. Um, so it's like Predator on VHS was on rotation in my house. Anytime... My mom asked me what I would want to watch. Predator would be one of those ones that I would pick. Friday the 13th, yep. Predator. Those were the those were the films. So it's like, and I know by AVP, um, I I was rooting for Predator, just like I'm rooting for Jason or I'm rooting for, rooting for Freddy. It's like that is uh, that's my guy. So it's like I'm a Predator fan. I go to these films. I don't care if Adrian Brody's in it. You know what I mean? Like I yeah, don't care. You're there for the Adrian Predator. Brody. It's like, I don't care if Shane Black's directing. I, I, I'm i there to see a predator. So it's like, mm -hmm. he's transcended that, you know, he is pop culture. Um, He's who I'm rooting for now. So it's like, no matter what, I'm going to go into Prey. Rooting for Predator, just is. Oh, you know? yeah. No, absolutely. I 100% agree with you. But we've talked almost 20 minutes here, and we haven't even started the episode. So I'm going to get us right in here. Uh, Just going to bring everything up on screen for us right now. Um. Yeah, Predator 2 is what we were discussing today. So, Luke, while I'm popping everything up here, I want to ask you, what is your first exposure to Predator 2? Where did this pop up on your radar? Uh, as you said, you were a, v you're a kid of the VHS era. I was, too, um, you know, at least for a little while there. Uh, I'm kind of in that middle ground where it's like, you know, I had a VHS player. We had tons of VHS tapes. I would watch them. But it, I think probably by the time I was about four or five, uh, DVDs were kind of becoming the the standard by that point. Yeah. So, 
Um, so what was the release date on this? 1990? 1990, yes. I don't know what the turnaround for VHS is, was um, uh, at that point, but I remember um, having the VHS for Predator 2. And, I mean, we're talking, had to be early 90s at this point, uh, maybe 93. Now, coming from a guy who's Terminator 2 Judgment Day is the holy grail for me. You know what I mean? Uh, huge Arnie fan. Movie. Fucking love, love it. Terminator. So we're talking, I love Predator, always in my rotation. I have the VHS for Predator 2. And I pop it in, and I'm talking to uh, my mom at the point, being like, uh, you know, Arnold's going to show up in this one. And she says, Arnold's not in this one. And as a kid, I could not fathom in my head Arnold being a, such a big part in the original that you're telling me he's not in this. And even watching this movie, I'm waiting. Even though I'm told that Arnold's not in this movie, he's going to pop up. That's what mm -hmm. I believed as a kid. So I, I, I hit, there was a stigma, I'll be honest. As a kid for Pred Predator 2, I hated it. I could not really? stand it because he was not in it. I love seeing the Predator on film. But because I, at, even as a kid, I was a huge fan of Predator. I just liked the way he looked. I had his action figures. But I could not stand Predator 2 because Arnold was not in it. No, I get it. Um, for me, I had seen Predator. I think it was uh, probably during, I know it was the summertime. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly the first time I watched Predator, but I know that it was one, it was probably during AMC's, when, like in the summertime, they would always do those Saturday night yes. uh, movies on AMC where you'd be able to just sit down and watch it. I bet you I watched it on there. Um, there was another one. I think it was the Fox channel. I think like it was. FX? Had, no, it wasn't FX. Okay. Like Fox had their own like kind of they play like their classic movies. It, it, I don't remember if it's that channel exactly, but um, they would play movies and they'd be for some reason. I had direct TV and this was we're talking maybe like 2004, 2005 ish. This happened. Um, and they're a little bit more uncensored than they would have been on AMC. So, you know, sometimes you'd see Gore. That's where I saw the thing for the first time. Uh, I saw some of the Halloween movies on there for the first time. Um, so, you know, like I kind of got a little bit more of exposure from that. Um, and I believe predator two, that was the first time I saw it. It was either that, or I rented it from the library okay. um, because I was a fan of predator uh, the Predator, and I knew the Predator 2 at that point it existed, and I had seen AVP. Now, I was a kid, I was such an AVP fan when that came out, because I didn't give a shit about the story. Yep. I was just happy to see these cool creatures, because I, I know I'd seen Alien and Aliens on there. So, like, seeing those two come together, I was the perfect age. I had a Alien versus Predator birthday party, where my mom and dad, they got... Um, a fog machine in our house. They blew up green and black balloons and they threw them all over. They're supposed to be alien eggs and yeah. everything. And me and my buddies from school were coming over, just playing alien versus predator, running through my house, killing each other. Um, you know, that's just the, the kind of nerdy fandom that I had even back then. Um, so predator two for me, I just remember it probably had to have been maybe around 11 o'clock at night. It comes on, I'm watching it. And I remember just being engrossed with it. I, I my dad had already told me uh, that Arnie was not in it, but I, I wasn't as militant, I guess, as you were about that, where you're just yeah. like, no, let's that's finish. Cool. Listen, not... as a five or six year old, you're stuck in your ways. You oh, know, I Arnold's understand. Not showing up. I understand. But like, you know, for some reason I was like, OK, that's fine. I get that because maybe in my head I thought, you know, oh, well, they'll just bring him back for a later sequel at some point. You know what I mean? They're gearing this up. Um, and, you know, I was just really sucked into it. I, I remember specifically um, and we'll get into more specifics in the movie in a minute. But like I remember specifically the alley sequence. Yes. With, uh, yeah, that was a big one King for Willie. me. Yep. King Willie. Um, I obviously remember the ending with all the predators. I thought that was so cool. And obviously that, the, as a kid uh, that got my attention, the alien skull being in the predator ship, yep. like that, all that stuff really set me off. And I think that's why I, I've always had a soft spot for this movie. For me, this movie has never been one of those ones where I'm just like, Oh, I, I, you know, predator two sucks or is, is even on a lower quality. Like I always knew that I preferred predator. 
but Predator 2 for me, I always thought was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and it wouldn't be till years later uh, that I think I, I got like a pack of the movies on DVD or something when I was like maybe 10. Uh, and like I was watching them and I could really start to appreciate the movie a little bit more for what it was. Actually, you know what? No, I remember it came on Netflix when Netflix got really early into that streaming stuff. Yeah. Um, right at the start of that, I remember one night I watched, um, I think like Iron Man two, and then I just put on Predator two for some reason, and I hadn't seen it in years You're at that point. And I was just like, yeah, no, I was just like, I'll just throw this on, whatever. And uh, that's I think where I really started to appreciate the movie some more. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it's just one of those fond memories. Like I, I will always think back because like one of the things we would do was always like. Uh, for some reason, I, I wanted to have it to where we camp out in our living room at, on weekends. I'd build a little bed with a bunch of blankets and pillows on the ground. My dad would sleep on the couch and like I would just watch these movies at night after he's long fallen asleep. Like he'd be like, oh, yeah, watch this. This is great. And then he'd fall asleep and I'd watch it like I'll never forget uh, watching Die Hard 3 and the thing for the first time on that Fox movie network channel or whatever it was. Um, yeah. And, you know, this was in that wheelhouse as well. So, I mean, Predator 2 for me has always been something that I've been fairly positive on. And it's nice uh, getting older and seeing more people uh, get more, uh, like, appreciative for the film. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just showing more appreciation. And that's where... Um, now, FX also did show Predator 2 quite a bit. And mm -hmm. this is more so where I, I kind of grew in appreciation for it. They had a thing called... I think it was, like... Um, DVD on TV where they had like two hosts and, and they would break down like they would give you DVD extras while you're watching Ooh, the, cool. the show. So it would be like, um, you know, they would they pointed out the the xenomorph skull and, and things like that. And they would talk about it very briefly. It was just little segments before coming back into actually watching the film. And Predator 2 was one of the ones that they had always shown like regularly. It was always on there. So um you know, and me, I think this was mid 2000s. Um, so it's like anytime that was on, I'm not going to not watch Predator 2. So and, and you know how cable is where it's like mm -hmm. we show it once, you know, we show it today. We're going to show it tomorrow and then we're going to show it next week. And we're, you know, it's like on this rotation where it's going to be shown several times in the span of only a couple of weeks. Um, so I would always catch it. And I think that's really where my love for predator 2 came because it, it's like it doesn't match up to the original no but it's unique in its own way mm -hmm. um and it kind of it does have a lot to offer especially when you dissect this film as to kind of opening up that predator culture and uh kind of unpacking what exactly makes uh the predator the predator so it's like i think this is a unique film and i think you know that's where we talk about the streaming services and cable and things like that where it's like I don't know if if I didn't have cable and this wasn't on TV. I don't know. I mean, I would have went back. Me being a Predator fan, but like, I don't know if a lot of general fans would get a love for Predator if you know it wasn't on rotation regularly. So I'm always curious about that because I know like if I didn't love Predator and I had seen Predator Two as a kid and it was just streaming, I don't know if I would have ever went back to it. But like being on cable regularly really uh, grew my love for the sequel oh yeah and i mean like i know that like you and i were lucky having the parents that we had to where they were cultured and they did want to they they showed us movies like this or or rambo and stuff like that and like you know they just knew that we had an interest in cinema and an interest in these uh kind of movies and stuff um so it's kind of like it, it's just it's unique and i i wonder just how kids today i'm, I'm curious to see you know, whatever iteration of Splattercast in another 15 years uh, when people get on here and they start talking about, you know, um, where they got the exposure. Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be like, well, I was on Netflix and I put this on and then I got to see it. They get to see it totally uncensored. As to us, when we watched on cable, we had to watch things sometimes pretty censored. So, yeah, for me, you know, and then we'll, we'll kind of keep moving along here. But for me, um one of the things that always caught me off guard was like, I'd watch these movies and I'd have these memories of watching them. Cause like, maybe I see it on cable a couple of times and then I would get it on DVD or Blu-ray later on down the road. And I'd be watching it and I'd be like, Whoa, like there are totally whole like micro scenes that I don't even remember 
seeing in yep. certain movies and it would just make me feel like what did i get did i get a special cut or anything and i guess you know i just couldn't like process or remember that uh i had seen these on cable so sometimes they were cut up even on that fox movie network where it's like i'm like i'm telling you there some of that stuff i, I really think they were only censoring out like nudity and sex because like i'm i can almost vaguely remember seeing uh the scene in die hard three where uh john mcclain's in the elevator and he just shoots those guys and there's all that blood and stuff like that i remember yeah. uh seeing um dylan get his arms blown off in predator and stuff yeah. like that and seeing all that in graphic detail you know like so it's just like it, they kind of got to pick and choose what they what they cut out you know at that point so yeah it always seemed like the like certain things i because even going back nowadays where uh, they always had that TV cut, and then they had, like, the actual cut cut. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that TV cut would be heavily edited in terms of, oh, so this is a connector scene to this, and since we're censoring this, we got to get rid of this. Or sometimes they want to get rid of that, and that scene that they left in wouldn't make any sense without the scene previously Yes, that they yeah. had taken out. So it's like, you know, even sometimes it's ingrained in my head that TV cut. So sometimes even going back, depending on how many how many times I've watched, I'm like, I don't even remember this. And this film's like twenty years old. But it's like you know they had that 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 cable TV cut was such a ingrained in your head because you would see it on rotation regularly. That sometimes it's just stuck in there. So it's like when you're going to watch that Blu-ray cut, um, you're like, oh yeah, this scene does exist, and now that scene makes more sense because I did see this. Yeah, that is the luxury that we got to grow up with, watching stuff like that. And then, obviously, I had the, like I said, the library to help me fill in the blanks on certain things. Because, like, I'd get a DVD or a VHS tape from them. Uh, one specifically that I remember was I'd never seen Rambo 3, and they never had it on DVD. But I'd always ask, and for some reason, I don't know why they would never tell me. I think because this was probably about 2007, 2008. Um, so VHSs were basically long, starting to get long yeah. dead by then. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So like, but some, this one lady finally was just like, we have it on VHS. And I was just like, oh, I, I got a VHS player. Um, and like, I finally got to see Rambo three and I was just like, okay, that was cool. You know, like even back then Rambo three to me was never the golden child, like Rambo two yeah. and first blood were at that point. And then by that point, I think, uh, the new one rambo was just coming out or about to come out so you needed like, that connector piece of three yes i did like um and you know it's one honestly not to get on a rambo soap box but it's the only one that i i don't really ever go back to i have that yeah. uh, steel book set and out of all of them it's the only one i haven't cracked open yet so well those i'll get there at some good. point oh that dude the first two are amazing like well we'll have to find a way to discuss those at some point because i could talk rambo and stallone and schwarzenegger's careers we could literally do an entire an entire other podcast just on like the macho 80s action stars uh I'm like i mean i'm getting your head spinning now i know there so we go. we'll have to get into it but without further ado let's get into our first segment here let's dive deep into predator 2 here with account of the macabre maybe <laughs> it didn't well maybe we'll find through. that yeah uh... here we go the film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths in particular sally hardesty and her invalid brother franklin it is all the more tragic in that they were young but had they lived very very long lives they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. All right. I think I got my light situation figured out, too. Sorry, it ain't going to be perfect. I'm just having a whole big of mess here on the Predator 2 podcast. But anyway, on this segment, we like to kind of dive deep into the synopsis of the film. Luke likes to give us his uh, written statements, just what he was able to come up with and pull, giving us a basic rundown of the movie. And then we just kind of talk about the story in general. So, Luke, without further ado, let us know what's going on in Predator 2. I got you right here. 
Lieutenant Michael Harrigan battles the ever-growing crime epidemic in Los Angeles in the sweltering heat wave of 1997. As Harrigan is caught in the drug war between the Jamaicans and the, Col the Colombians, he encounters a problem out of this world. With help from his team of detectives Danny and Leona, they dispatch a group of Colombians during an all-out war in the city. Once Harrigan takes out the Colombian gang, he catches the eye of the predator that likes the way he kills. As Mike and his crew head back to the precinct, they run into new recruit Jerry Lambert, a renegade cop who is paired with Leona. Harrigan is called into the chief's office as he is reprimanded and introduced to Peter Keyes, a shady CIA agent who tells Harrigan to stay out of his way. As the bodies in L.A. pile up, courtesy of the Predator, the alien who has an affection for spines and skulls makes things personal when he kills Danny while he is investigating a crime scene after hours. Vowing to find Danny's killer, Harrigan, Leona, and Jerry do their own investigation as they follow Keyes and his men. Taking a subway downtown and crossing paths with some unsavory gang members, Leona and Jerry find themselves in a battle that welcomes our scaly, dreadlock friend to do a little killing of his own. Jerry finds himself on the losing battle as Leona is spared once the Predator realizes she is newly pregnant, giving us a glimpse of his code of honor. As Harrigan learns the news, he chases down the Predator to the Slaughterhouse District, where he runs into Peter Keyes once again. Realizing what the Predator is and what he does, he wa he watches as Keys and his men are slaughtered, joining the cattle corpses in the giant freezer building. The chase between Harrigan and the Predator leads through an apartment building and eventually to the Predator's spaceship. As they battle to find out who the Alpha is, Harrigan gives the Predator one swift blow to with his own smart disc. The Predator finds himself as a trophy on Harrigan's wall. As Harrigan believes it's over, he ends up surrounded by a gang of predators, but realizing he bested one of their own, they pay their respects and give Harrigan a gun marked Raphael Adolini, 1718. Harrigan makes his way off the ship as it departs, leaving him in a pile of dust, knowing they will be back again, but there is nothing he can do because, hey, shit happens. That's a, that's a great way to sum it up. I do apologize again. It seems like StreamYard here has been giving us a couple of issues today. It uh, cut you off for a second when I tried to get you in the solo layout, but we did get the gist. It was only about a second's worth of that that was cut out. That was vital um, information, Dylan. Damn it. I know. I apologize, guys. But we'll work out the bugs. Could be my computer. I need to upgrade. I'm working on it. But anyway, back into Predator 2 here. Yes. Uh, I actually think... You know, if we're talking about the story of this movie as a sequel, it's a worthy sequel. I think that this, the story itself uh, is really great. I think they really take advantage of the setting that they use um, as it being more of an urban setting, bringing it into the city. Um, it's just a really cool idea to see what happens because, like, we saw Predator in the jungle. You know, the, obviously yeah. the first one's known as the Jungle Hunter. Um and don't they call him anytime or uh, anything like what is his little nickname that they give him in the lore? I think it's like anytime or something like that. It's one of the, in the original. Yes. Yes. Anytime. Yep. Anytime is his nickname in the original. It's a little moniker. So, yeah. yeah. And so it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, you have him out in the jungle doing his thing, uh, being stealthy and kind of almost like a more naturalistic setting for him. Now you've taken that fish and you've thrown him in completely into a different tank. Yeah. where there's people all over the place, there's equal opportunity for him to get spotted, anything, and you really get to see how he works in a society. And I thought that was really cool and a really unique setting. Even as a kid, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, this is neat. I like this. Um, and I mean, really, uh, just if we want to get into the start of the movie, I think that this movie opens with a literal uh, a bang, for sure, with that yeah. massive shootout. And I, I think that that's one of the most intense and best parts of the movie in my opinion, is, is a great way to introduce the Predator and our characters. Um, you know, and I just to back up very briefly, that, that opening scene where we play that kind of jungle music that was oh, yeah. in, uh, in the original, and we transition from the jungle into the city, and then we go straight into the point of view of the Predator. Um, I think that's a great little uh, wink and a nod from the original to say, hey, we remember the original, but we're not in the original anymore. We're bringing it to a different time, you know? So it's like, it's a perfect transition shot into the sequel of this. And then we are thrown into that battle between the Jamaicans or no, no, the Colombians and the police force. Um, and I love that because 
again, it really watching the original, it's it's a slow start. It, it mm-hmm. takes its time. This one, we are thrown into something completely different. It is really um, you have to really like your attention is being pulled every which way here. And that's what they're trying to do. The, the opening here almost has a very RoboCop feel in the sense where it's like kind of I think this is supposed to be 1997. So it's kind of a little bit in the future, only a, a tiny bit. Um, so it kind of has that, um, you know, that kind of uh, post-apocalyptic, a little bit like that, um, where we really have a huge crime problem, which I think is evident uh, in that that late 80s, early 90s um, actuality of, you know, Los Angeles. Uh, but, you know, it's like I really think they wanted that different feel, um, and I think they achieved it. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think that they they really do a good job of setting this film apart from the first one. Uh, just like you said, it's a slow build in the first film and like, you know, to, you know, kind of more of a traditional sense of telling a story like this, where it's like you have a creature or something like that, where you kind of want to build into that with this, you're right. They throw you right into the perspective of the predator. You can just kind of see him skulking around there. It always makes me interested. How long has he been around? Like, yeah. I like to think that he's been there because really as we get deeper into the film, not to jump too far ahead, when you start learning things like, uh, he comes down to the meat meat factory or meat locker station to eat every few days. It's kind of like, has he been here kind of scouting everything out and figuring out? Cause these things are, are very intelligent and they, they are, you know, they use their code of honor and their way of uh, hunting. They have a, a kind of like a set way of doing things. So yeah. it's like, has he been mapping this all out for, you know, a couple days, a few weeks by this point it- before he strikes? And that's I mean, what I've always felt because it's like as soon as it's not like he's I don't feel like he stumbled upon that giant battle. It's like he's nestled in getting a view of the city, watching it all go down. I think he is legitimately he finds Harrigan right there. And I think that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that alpha. Oh, um, yeah. So and it's like he's like at a at a, everyone in here. Who can I, I fixate on and pick out of the pack for a trophy on my wall? So it's like. I think he's been in the city probably for a good chunk of time already and just been picking out um, his his next big alpha, his next big nice trophy. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, we get introduced to all of our characters here. We really get to see how they, they operate. And you get that kind of late 80s, early 90s uh, action where it's like it's all practical. Uh, you know, we're, we're not inundated with CG just yet or anything like that. So, you know, they're really ripping off car doors and, you know, shooting blanks everywhere. So you really feel that intensity. And I mean, you have this fantastic filmmaker, classic filmmaker, John McTiernan, uh, covering the first film. So like, you know, that's a lot to live up to because that guy, he did Die Hard. He's done all kinds of stuff that are just considered modern day action, action classics. And Predator is up there as probably in his top three. Um, and you know, you have Stephen Hopkins coming in here, um, who steps in to take this one over. And I think he does a great job with the action. I think that it still lives up to that intensity. Um, and you know, for this movie, having the budget that it has, I'd say that this opening is even more impressive because could you imagine coordinating all of this, especially without having the luxury of like adding computer generated effects here and there? Yeah. Um, cause you have literally like people, there's all this chaos in the streets that then leads into this building where, you know, you see all these guys, the Colombian drug lords, uh, they're getting ready to go back out and shoot up the police and everything. You got Harrigan and his partner. They're running up the steps is Danny. I think it is the one he goes yes. up with. Yep. Yeah. Him and Danny are running up the steps They're They're getting ready to infiltrate. And that's when it all happens. This is the, the first real introduction to the predator that we get, which unlike the first is very early. But I like how they do it where they keep him cloaked. So a lot like the first movie where he is cloaked uh, early on, but you still get to see the prowess and the power in a sense of what this thing is capable of because he drops down from the glass and he just eviscerates these guys. And you can just see the fear in their eyes as they're going through. And I I think that that's such an awesome scene. And I think you really get to see, uh, like I said, the intensity and the action here and just kind of the vibe they're going for. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of really intense scenes when the predator is involved. We'll get to it later, but the subway sequence yeah. uh, also another great intense battle uh, sequence. And like you were saying um, just a few minutes ago about how they kind of play into the stigma of where LA was at that time. 
um because like they everybody is on high alert it's supposedly like one of the hottest summers on record which they then they then they then use as a consistency for the predator lore saying that they like to come when it's hot and they like when it's uh, when there's conflict so that that's like kind of the predator's wheelhouse that's their bread and butter and uh that that um i i like that you know, we're we're shown the Colombians. They're getting ready for this battle. They, you know, they take refuge in their in their uh, building, and they're getting ready for this battle with the police. And then we kind of throw um, a wrench in the whole plan when the predator breaks through the glass, and it's like, okay, now we're dealing with this threat here. And I do enjoy that. I like that cut where he jumps through the he's going through the glass, and it's kind of their reaction. And then we go right back down in the streets where there's a giant explosion coming from up from the police point of view. So it's like, we don't really get too much from that. We just know kind of the fallout of everything. And then they go up. Um, and then, you know, we get the El Scorpio, you know, freaked mm -hmm. out running. And I love that where he is going through, he he's battling the predator without them even knowing that he's battling the predator. And oh, yeah. that's with fear. Um, and then kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess in a sense, Harrigan almost steals the kill uh, from the predator. Um, I, I just love that scene. One of the things I don't want to go already getting into my re-editing of, of the screenplay or anything like that, but when I'm watching this on a couple of different viewings, I really, because we don't get that kind of, we get glimpses of that underworld, but it's not really the focus here. Um, I really think it would have been interesting to see that character, El Scorpio, get away. So then he is paranoid throughout the the entire film because the predator is stalking him because he also wants to get that kill as well. Um, and we're kind of introduced maybe to a King Willie in a more expansive fashion rather than just that meeting with Harrigan or uh, anyone from the Colombian side of things, you know, because we only see that stuff very briefly. So I really would have loved the kind of, you know, the police chasing after a killer, what they think is a killer, but then El Scorpio knowing what that is um, and kind of, trying to take refuge somewhere uh and as he as he goes to find mm -hmm. refuge he's leading the predator into killing basically everyone in the underworld because it is following him um so i think that would have been an interesting um kind of dichotomy in, in that script because i i as we get farther into this i don't know i feel like the script was missing something in a sense where um that opening where we we see all the characters, Leona, Danny, and Harrigan, where we're seeing them all at once, and you're like, okay, so we're being introduced to them all on the screen at one time here. They're all really going to get their own moments later. That doesn't really happen that much. You know, it's uh, it's like that opening, you feel like you're almost trying to catch your breath because of so much is going on, and you're like, okay, they're going to give me room to breathe, but they don't really. You know, it's like always trying to catch your breath almost, and that's kind of my critique for this film. Uh, as we get into it, it's it's very hard. You don't really get that breather, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And we're getting so much that nothing gets fully developed. Like, you know, in that first Predator film where it's like, you're, you're attributed moments and then Blaine gets killed. Oh, and then, okay, we, we go for a minute. And then, you know, and then other things happen. But, you know, this one's kind of go, go, go. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's a very effective opening. I think it's great. I do like, even though I think El Scorpio would have been an interesting kind of story to tell throughout the film i do like how he meets his demise in terms of falling off the building after harrigan shoots him you know i think that was very interesting and then also going into kind of the the difference between the original we don't get that many kills here but as soon as um el scorpio is killed and they go into you know basically the mayhem that the predator caused i mean there's bodies all over oh, gore, yeah. blood everything yeah no they really don't shy away from that and i think that that's what i appreciate because i think through the whole movie um, they really show what this thing is capable of. Because you have, like, you go from, God, how many people are in the first one that could potentially get killed? Because, I mean, he doesn't even kill any of the the guy, the the camp, the encampment that they take over in the first film. Yeah. That's all the soldiers. So what we have, like, eight, eight people, five, six, seven, eight people um, yeah, that, that potential victims. It's not a lot. You have an entire city here. You have entire yeah. gangs. You have entire so police cat, forces. Cat. Yeah. A body count was going to go up. Right, oh regardless. yeah and, and i enjoy and, it because it, it, it makes it feel different than the original oh yeah and it's like just the fact that we don't see it all on screen but we see yep. the aftermath is is huge because then it's um kind of moving forward 
you know, it's not long after. I, I do want to hint, uh, we do get some great development with uh, Danny Glover's character, which I know that uh, he gets a lot of, like, I guess a lot of flack, especially back then when the movie was coming out, as to why are you going this route with it? Why are you casting him uh, when you had, like, somebody like an Arnold Schwarzenegger come in in the first film? I think he kills it. I think that he's a, just a totally different kind of character. He is uh, a cop. He's got those the morals, the code, and that's why I think they kind of chose that route because of yeah. how the character was going to be. Is like he doesn't have to be, you know, the brawniest, most ripped guy. He doesn't have to be the soldier. He still lives by a code of ethics, and he is. But he's also not afraid to cross that line and do what is what he has to do for the people that he loves. Because you can see the camaraderie between him and his team, especially as we get into here in a moment with um, Jerry, who is a new addition to the team. Um, which you know, obviously is uh, played by the late, great Bill Paxton. Uh, rest in peace. We absolutely adore you. Um, gone too soon, in my opinion, but left uh, a massive, uh, wonderful body of work. Um, you know, and they kind of show just what you can do. Like, you said it best um, off air a couple days ago, I think when we were covering Pearl, um, you had said that, you know, he kind of proves himself there early on. And then, like, he tells him straight up, in this kind of meeting that they have when they introduce Jerry of just how, you know, like we are a tight knit group here. You know, if you help scratch our back, we'll scratch yours. And then you're, you're part of the family kind of thing. And, you know, it, it does show, I think why they went this route with it instead of going for just another Arnie type. Cause they tried to um, a little fun fact I have here is that at one point, uh, Patrick Swayze was approached to star on the film, but was unable to because he got injured on the film roadhouse in 1989. Could you imagine this movie with Patrick Swayze in it? Like, I love Patrick Swayze. Another one, uh, rest in peace, gone too soon. But, um, you know, just like, it would be a totally different movie. Yeah. I, I don't know if it would have worked, um, to be honest. Uh, I think I don't... he has to look, but yeah, I don't know if he would, I don't know if he's the right fit for a Predator movie. Well, and, and like, for me, I have my critique, my own critique on the casting of here, which I don't know where that fits in. Uh, as I've pitched to you my my take on how I think Predator 2 should have went, um, where, um, you know, it Arnie leaves big shoes to fill. It, there's no doubt about it. Um, whereas, do I think Danny Glover still feels less than? Yes. But do I think he does a great job as to what he's given? Absolutely. Oh, he um, kills it. I think um, he's fantastic. I, I enjoy his character on screen. Um, and, and again, one of my critiques here is there isn't enough character development. There are scenes in the, I read this um, second version of the script um, and there's a little bit more with him in, in there. And I think maybe that's the route they should have went. We don't see uh, in, um, I don't know, you know, cause I get my wires crossed. I don't know if they mentioned that he's been divorced twice. Um, I don't know. Uh, Cause that is in the screenplay. Uh, we don't see his home life at all you do see a little bit of that in that screenplay so it's like i do think maybe we should have spent more time in the personal life of of michael harrigan which we don't really get he's all business here which i understand i think that's maybe what they wanted to present here is an all business kind of police um officer which i understand but i think as an audience maybe we we want to see that kind of behind the curtain a little bit and see what he's dealing with outside of his job, which he just seems like my life is the job kind of uh, uh, police officer, which is fine. But I think it kind of um, is a little bit uh, kind of gives you a little critique on the character itself. Yeah. And, you know, the only thing that I can say that maybe why they sh took away from that is because you had Lethal Weapon come out in 87. And, you know, they really do lean into uh, Roger Murtaugh having that kind of family dynamic and kind of yeah. seeing some of that. And maybe they didn't want to, because he is still playing a detective of sorts, they didn't want to kind of cross that too deep. Because, I mean, at, you talk about Danny Glover. What's the first character you think of? I mean, yep. it's Murtaugh. It's, it's like he, he it's by far. I mean, I'll look at his filmography real quick, but. For me, I, I'd say that is the movie that you know him for. 
Yeah, and I, I do mean, like that he was the leading man here. here. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. he didn't get that. He was known as Murtal, you know, at that point in time and probably still today where it's like he is uh, a duo of sorts. He comes with Mel Gibson. So yeah. Riggs and Murtal are are the package deal. So it's nice to see him have a standalone film like this because he doesn't have um, – he has some, but not many like this. He's a major supporting actor for sure. And I mean, yeah. you can, I'm going through his filmography right now. And yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, he doesn't have a lot of starring roles, but I mean, the stuff that he's in, I mean, he's Danny freaking Glover. Like he's fantastic. Like, yeah. it's just one of those things where it's like, he, he is a character actor. He takes the role that you give him and he gives you everything that he can. And I think that that's why I'll always appreciate the work that he gives us. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I think that may be why they did it. Um, you know, kind of, we, we kind of spun off into that a little bit, but the point I was going to make before we moved on here was we get a little bit of character development with his character of Harrigan showing that he's afraid of heights. And, yeah. you know, I always think that little tweaks like that, little tinges, especially in your action movies and stuff like that, they can really go a long way by showing us and grounding these people, showing how human they are. Um, because like, yes, he is, this he should have a hundred other things that terrify him being an la cop in the in 97 well in the future of 97 at this point you know um you know fighting gang lords and stuff like that but no it's it's heights that get him and they play up really well with that towards the end of the film as well um but yeah i mean like we kind of move on from there he gets reprimanded back at the station from his boss basically saying you know uh they can't keep going in here, run and gun. And you get introduced uh, to Gary Busey's character of keys. And they basically make it, uh, you know, your, your standard A to B plot here of he's taking over the case. You got to step away. Is he FBI? Is he CIA? We don't really know. It's not fully clear. You just got to back off Harrigan. And he's like, Oh, you know, I kind of, no, I can't, you know what I mean? Like I'm doing my own thing here. Um, you know, but he, 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 at least, agrees that he'll take a step back you know to an extent yeah but because it's not until after the next scene in which we see the jamaican uh gang uh gangs get introduced which you know by this point um they think it not harrigan's team but the news the media they're spinning it as the jamaicans came in whilst they were in the shootout with the police and they cleaned house on the colombians yeah. because they have a notorious uh you know rivalry they are kind of the reason that it's all out war in LA right now is because you have these two rival gangs run one by King Willie. And I don't even think we really get the, the leader of the Colombian sides name or anything, at least in the film, maybe in the script, since you read it, they kind of go into it, but I don't remember. And that is the man hanging upside down, I believe. I believe I, I got that much, but I didn't think that, you know, they really even expressed who that was. No, no, they don't. Um, yeah. and, and that's um, in, in the script. I know they give him a name because in the script, uh, you know how they cut out his heart in, mm. in in the film. And then they have the the lady he was with lives. Um, and it's a great her, scene, by the way. I love all of that. Um, and they put her in the ambulance. Actually, in the script, he's the one that lives and he's totally comatose. Oh, um, I, they don't go much else with it. I mean, he's wheeled off and put into a helicopter as Jerry finds. But even, and again, going into that, Jerry gets a better, more character development in the script. It's not much, but it's more. Um, so he, we don't really get a lot of time even with him. I could, obviously, the story's not about him. So, and, and that's where, um, again, I feel like we're trying to do this balancing act of, Okay, open up the Colombians. Now it's time to go to the Jamaican side of things. Then we get the King Willie, and then we don't really touch too much on it, where it's like, I think, again, me doing my own work on the script would be like, oh, El Scorpio goes into the whole underworld, and we kind of we He's get our guy um, with each one. So um, we're, really, it's like, I, I feel like the Colombians and Jamaicans almost just become a plot device. I mean, I think they play into that setting of Los Angeles in 1997. Um, but again, I think they're there for the body count, which I mean, I don't mind. But, yeah. um, you know, they're kind of just there as serviceable uh, cannon fodder into a sense, which I, I think it, it it ends up the the, the kill scenes with um, uh, the Jamaicans in, in the Predator, I think, are, are lovely. 
I mean, oh like, yeah, I was about to say, getting into that scene, I mean, it opens up with uh, the head of the, I guess, the Colombian side of the the drug lords, uh, having sex with this woman, and they have this great um, kind of like it starts way far back from the skyscraper, and then we cut in. Then Such we a cut weird in again. cut for me. It I don't is, know. It's I don't know. It's always stuck in my mind, though. So that's why I got to give it. I think they were going um, for the vulgarity almost. So you know what I mean. I think that. I, eh. I don't know. Because, like, you, this is a weird comparison. You see Ari Aster do a very similar thing in uh, Midsummer with yeah. the phone at the beginning, where yep. it's like it's ringing because they have a beat, like in the score, where it's like boom, boom, boom. And they just keep going in closer and closer. Yeah. I don't know why. I just, that is where my head went immediately watching it this time. But, like, they, so they get this it. Is an elevated creature feature. Yes, I think so. I think that there's a lot more here. I think that. The real culty stuff they really play into towards the end, um, and they put all the the final predator in that big flower dress and stuff. I think that's really there. Cool. We go. Yeah, and Ar- then, honestly, so who's in the bear suit, Danny Glover. Yeah. Or uh, no, 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 no. It would be uh, unfortunately it would have to be Gary Busey. It'd be Keys oh, who perfect. goes in the bear suit. But um, yeah, honestly, Ari-, Ari Aster just ripped off Predator Two for Midsummer. That's, that's what we're really getting at. We're on we're here. To. Thank you for tuning in. An hour <laughs> in, and we are finally getting to the. The, the oh, yeah. point of why we wanted to do this um but yeah no getting into that scene i think it's awesome how they set it up they hang the guy upside down uh very emulating the predator very similar to what he does with his own victims um and the predator at some point sneaks in uh and he's kind of watching these guys do their thing i do love the line that the the leader of that little crew says to the guy where he's like oh i'm not gonna i'm not just gonna take your heart i'm actually gonna take your soul um because that's what he says when he's cutting out his heart um which they never actually get to because suddenly the predator shows itself or someone notices it i think or does he 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 does yeah he he jams the blade that's right okay Um, yeah he stabs him and then everything kind of pops off right after that. Yeah, and then uh, then Goldtooth, I believe, says shit happens. And then we mm-hmm. cut to another one of the gang members as he's turning toward the window in the laser. He sees the laser. The That's what it is. Yep. So then everything kind of goes topsy-turvy where uh, we see the netting, which I love. Yeah. That is that is such a creative, and that's the thing, why you have such an elevated body count in this one, I feel, is because the Predator has so many more toys, so yep. many more things to bring into this that we didn't have in the first movie. Like, there's a lot of really classic stuff that gets brought in here with the netting, which you do see pop back up in AVP, and then the discs, which I think have been used now in every single yeah, iteration the smart of the Predator Yeah, the discs are sense. one of my favorite weapons. Um, I absolutely love them. I think it's... it's, it's and I think I had read somewhere... Um, that you know with beginning the production of predator 2 they had much more time to kind of sit and think about things so they kind of came up with a lot of weaponry uh for the predator um and kind of different unique things that they could do so it's like this the retractable staff i think is great as well um it works so well it's like you know that that scene with the jamaicans is such a showcase of all his new weapons I agree. Uh, one thing I want to mention too, a little fun fact for you about that staff is that uh, the spear that was used in the film disappeared and was reportedly stolen after filmmaking was or filming was complete. So somebody out there somewhere has the original staff for Predator 2, um, probably passing it down to family members by this point. Uh, I, if I was that guy, I'd keep it up on a mantle somewhere. Because that thing is badass. Like, that is such a yeah. great addition to the Predator. Like, it's synonymous with the character at this point. I think almost every iteration, almost every NECA figure that you get now comes with a staff of some sort. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, like, even in the later movies, I'm sure um, in Prey, he'll have a bow staff of some kind at some point. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's too early. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, we kind of get to see him just eviscerate the this crew of people. And uh, it's quickly right after that, Harrigan and his team show up. Uh, They take the woman. uh, They try to get her some help, basically try to get her to the hospital where Keys uh, ends up coming in and disrupting everything and saying, this is my crime scene. You know, you get to see Gary Busey and, uh, you know, uh, oh, my God, I'm I'm, Danny Glover. Uh, They, uh, they, you know, they are. At odds still. 
Yeah, and they're they're great. I love them throughout this entire film. I think they they play well off of each other, uh, especially in the third act. Here, they get something really good that I, I'll discuss. Um, I just I think the moment towards the end. Uh, I don't know why I got so much more out of it during this viewing uh, than I did in earlier viewings, but you know they they come in, they let that all go down. Um, Danny, I think, is the one that notices. Uh, one of the predator's weapons, the little spear dart, like thing. The air shaft it's, or whatever it is. Yes. So he tells um, Danny Glover's character Harrigan about it, and then Harrigan kind of tells him, you know, okay, once the the, the scene's kind of wrapped up and everything, go back in there and see what you can find and report back. This kind of kicks off the Harrigan and the predator. Um, kind of stuff. This is why I wanted to go over this section in details because Danny goes back in there uh, shortly after this and unfortunately meets his demise to the Predator, which again, I don't think the Predator ever left. Um, so while they're cleaning up the scene and everything like that, he's still there. I think yeah. he's just like, he's sizing everybody up. Again, to your point, trying to figure out who the Alpha is here. And so far, all he can kind of come together is Harrigan. So what's he going to do to antagonize him? He's going to kill one of his team, his, one of his, his crew, his family, his tribe. So he unfortunately, we don't see it. We only see uh, Danny get picked up, brought up to the ledge. We see the Predator, but we don't see exactly how he dies. Um, you know, I, I, I think they, they find his corpse afterwards, but, you know, they don't show it. They do cut away from it. Yeah, um, they just do him, his screams off, off camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think th in this screenplay, it is actually not his weapon that is up there. It is the chain from El Scorpio uh, that uh, the Predator leaves uh, there. And that's one of the things I do enjoy here. Um, and we'll see it uh, very briefly after um, where Danny drops uh, his necklace comes off. And we see that later on. I mean, we'll hop into it here in a second, but... We see it at the cemetery. Yeah, he leaves it almost as antagonizing um, Harrigan uh, a mm -hmm. little bit. And so it's like, I do like this kind of element that they, they've given here where you're saying, you know, he never left the crime scene. Where we have this uh, almost antagonizing voyeuristic predator where he is, uh, I think the, um, I think it's uh, Tony Pope gives him the moniker of werewolf killer. Um, it, it, in, during the media here where we're saying that this is a serial killer, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. I think that was such a fun play that I don't know necessarily that it was um, lived up to where it's like almost this kind of uh, film noir trying to solve a mystery. I, I think could have played up. I mean, like as weird as it sounds um, after watching the predator and we're sitting here in 2022 for me to say, this almost feels like, Shane Black could have directed this one and it could have turned out fairly decent um, is because it has those tones to it. It's the hard boiled the, detective story is kind of what you're leaning towards. I think when yeah. you say that, cause you, this, this gives you those shades, not too deeply, but you could see those shades of nice guys and um, kiss, kiss, bang, bang in yeah. there. So I, I totally get what you're saying. And I think that would have worked out well. Cause I know when we talked about this in by admission only, it would have been like, um, when we were specifically talking about the Predator and what we thought we were going to get as opposed to what we got. And I had mentioned, I feel like, you know, a, a film like The Nice Guys with a Predator dropped in would have worked out so well. You know, <laughs> so it's like, um, I, I think like that kind of um, trying to solve a case and we they don't, again, we don't dive. There are so many great ideas in Predator 2 that don't really get flushed out 100%, I don't think. So it's like that kind of idea of trying to solve a mystery of, a serial killer and then it turning out to be a predator, I think would have been a really fun. And I think we get hints of it, but we don't really dive that deep into it. I hear what you're saying. And honestly, Luke, I think that uh, Disney needs to pick you up just for like, you know, throwing out ideas for predator films. Cause this is the second one where I'm just like, there you go. That's a cool idea. I like that play into the predator two aspect of it. They'll just keep me like into, in like a dark room and, <laughs> I'll have like three uh, whiteboards all marked up, and then they're like, "Let's let's uh, let's get a new predator idea." Unlock the door. And I'm just sitting in there, <laughs> just like, yeah, like I got it. 
<laughs> it's just you have all the movies ready to go on repeat, even the ones you don't like, just so you have them, just to, to do it. And all the NECAs and anything you could ever want. See, for me, like how big of a nerd I am, I would need all the NECAs and all that stuff just because it'd be like, you know, I feel like pitching. I'd want to be like, well, see, like we take this one here and he does this and I'd just be playing with toys in front of them and just being like, see, he's going to string them up like this and gun them like that and stuff because like I'm such a visual kind of storyteller so you're like you know i have the shaman predator idea but you didn't give me the NECA figure so can't um, do it sorry you're like get that thing here out of the box and i'll have a movie in two days for you mm -hmm. <laughs> no just knocking on uh bob chapek's door like i broke this one i need a replacement please <laughs> i don't know i'm the halfway NECA through quality. the film <laughs> the NECA quality control has been weak lately but i need this um but yeah, I guess to kind of, we got to kind of keep the story moving here so we can get to the ending portion and then we can move on. But um, so after this, you know, Danny meets his demise. It's now become personal with Harrigan. He's made that very clear to his, you know, his boss is everything. Uh, he's made it very clear to Keys at this point with a pretty uh, great confrontation in the station. Um, and then he starts telling characters like Jerry and Leona, uh, that we need to start doing this kind of on our own. We need to start working on how we're going to, you know, find this guy. They still think it's a dude. Uh, at this point, I believe this is where uh, he requests an audience with King Willie, who is the leader of the Jamaican uh, crime syndicate. Yes. Um, and that's a very classic scene. A uh, scene, again, that really sticks out in my mind that I love of Harrigan goes there. They meet, they discuss some things. Uh, King Willie's very eccentric. He's uh, very much that old voodoo master kind of stuff where he's throwing the bones down and he's saying, you know, things ain't right here. Like, you know, he's not just some man. It's like, you know, there's something different about this guy. And lo and behold, right after Harrigan leaves, which again, you blame that voyeuristic kind of stalking nature of this predator, um, which again, I love about every single one of these characters. Um, if written correctly, each one of these predators has a different personality in every film. You yeah. have the ones where they, they really play into that, where this one is very much just like he likes to collect information before he attacks. And so he confronts King Willie. You just see that. I think it's like a brick or something falls yeah. off and it catches King Willie's attention. And he's just kind of like, oh, OK, that was crazy. And then you hear the splash again. And then you see the the steps as he's coming forward through the water and the little flashes as the the uh, the kind of cloaking device starts to malfunction a little bit with the water. Yeah. And, and then you think you're going to see this climactic battle. King Willie pulls out the sword and everything uh, and it immediately cuts to screaming and you just see the predator walking away with King Willie's severed head. Uh, such a great effect, such a great way to like misguide the audience and just be like, no, we, we don't even need to see what happens. You know what's going to happen here because he's yeah. no contest. You know what I mean? And that's uh, where it's like, um, again, kind of playing this game with Harrigan where I feel like he's just picking off people that Harrigan had been meeting with to kind of be like, hey, I'm on to you. Uh, I'm following in your footsteps here. So, you know, be alert. Look over your shoulder. Um, and I do love that cut between where King Willie's getting ready to fight him and he's lets out that scream and then it's a cut to just his severed head and is the predators walking away um and one of the things i kind of i i don't know if you get this reading but um i i kind of i've always gotten this um where i always feel like this predator in, in predator 2 is a little more clumsy than the jungle hunter where it's like um like he's not as um concerned about being concealed i guess where uh, he's, he's not paying attention. He's knocking bricks off, uh, off of buildings, you know, uh, and then he's stepping in water to kind of mess with his cloaking device. He, he also has that kind of, before he kills, um, one of the Jamaicans, he uncloaks himself to show himself almost that kind of, this is me. And even with Danny, where he uncloaks his arm so Danny can see what he's holding on to, or later on when he's jumping from car to car even though he's cloaked, obviously people know that he's there. He's not very um, smooth in any sense. So I feel like he's either very young or he's just an extremely clumsy. And this is like one of his first hunts. I don't know how to read that or if it was meant to be that, but I kind of always pick that up uh, from viewing this. 
that's a very interesting take. And I think that, again, it adds into this predator lore that I love is just that, yeah, he could be a younger predator who is trying to show off. We just don't know. Um, they definitely differ in, uh, you know, even their body presentation in certain yeah. ways. Like, I mean, I know that it comes down to uh, where they were with effects between the first one and the second one. But uh, mandibles wise, face wise, when we get the face reveal here in a little bit, which we'll get into, um, he does look different. Coloring is different. Um, you know, even just the body type, I would say it has a slight difference to it. So yeah. it's like, and the thing that I love about it is that, yeah, he could be a different species or a different subspecies of the predator. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, maybe they, this predator doesn't need to be a stealthy. Maybe he doesn't, you know, want to keep him. He wants to show who he is a little bit more, but I like the idea of you saying that he's clumsy. It definitely adds more to his character. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess kind of to, to get us there, to get us across the board so we can wrap up the synopsis section here. Um, you know, after this section, we kind of we get to the I believe the uh, cemetery scene is soon after this, which is a, a great sequence. Oh, I think uh, cemetery scene had already happened. Um, oh, did it already happen at that point? Yeah, because okay. one of the things I did want to mention is that um, in the script, um, one of the routes they don't go which i again expanding upon character do, doing different things here uh that's uh i guess harrigan in a sense is kind of blamed for danny's death um and they finally um suspend him so mm. he is totally out of the game and then he kind of goes rogue in that sense we well, st still has help from jerry and uh, leona but you know it's unofficial and i think i would have intrigued i've been intrigued by that route of him kind of uh, going off the grid a little bit and kind of doing things because especially like where we're saying he is just the job. He is this by the book kind of when it, but also can go rogue when needs to be to kind of totally flip that on its head. And he's doing everything. He kind of slips into a darker element because he's kind of so, so, um, it, what am I trying to say here? He's so like um, obsessed with mm -hmm. trying to find the killer. killer. Yeah. Um, I think that would have been an interesting take on it. But so, um, and in the screenplay, when he is at the cemetery, it is not Danny's necklace. It is instead, um, no, no, you are right. Um, because uh, the, the cemetery scene would have had to happen afterward because in the screenplay, it is when it, it's some of King Willie's dreadlocks that's hanging, not Danny's necklace. Mm -hmm. So then he finds Danny's necklace. It's a great sequence where he goes to visit Danny's grave. Um, they are, you know, he's, he's there. He says a couple of words. They have this great uh, interaction with this kid who's walking around with an Uzi, just shooting stuff. And he, he notices the predator in the tree, I believe. Yeah, he's in the tree and he sees him cloaked. Yeah. And he says, you want some candy? And the predator kind of, you know, as they do, uh, he takes a liking to that phrasing and he just ends up repeating it. Um, and back again, to, I do like uh, that little development where he sizes up the kid, noticing mm -hmm. that he has yeah. a toy gun, you know. And yes, then, it shows the intellect and intelligence of the creature. Of yep, This is not that, a worthy At opponent. that point, you're probably like, oh, man, is he just going to, you know, viewing this for the first time, you're like, is he really going to take out this kid, you know, thinking he's got a real gun? And then, you know, sizes him up. It's like, oh, no, it's. It, you know, and then kind of just, um, you know, goes about his day, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, no threat here. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And he leaves uh, Danny's necklace for Harrigan to find, which sets Harrigan off on this, this strange thing of paranoia where he thinks the serial killer is uh, following him. He knows that for sure now. And he knows that he's messing with him. And he's making it very personal. Which I like that choice way more than uh, King Willie's dreadlocks. You know, like that one, it just doesn't feel as personal, whereas Danny's necklace feels extremely personal. And it really feels almost, you know, serial killers and their souvenirs, where it's like mm -hmm. um, it really feels uh, like a serial killer. So I think that was a great change up from the original screenplay. I agree. Um, so then this kind of leads us into, uh, I may be missing some spots, but I think we start getting into the subway stuff here pretty soon. Yeah. Um, so for the sake of time, I will just kind of skip to that and then we'll skip to the ending bit here. But, uh, we kind of get into this point where Leona and Jerry, um, they're making their way onto, uh, the subway. Um, and they have this great interaction. They're just chit chatting, and we'll making their way through cars. And, uh, this gang member starts messing with this guy 
or a presumed gang member. He's probably just a, a hoodlum and his his fools. Um, they start messing with this guy and uh, they start telling him like get out of his seat or whatever. And uh, he ends up pulling a gun on him. And then the guy's like, oh, well, mine's bigger. And he pulls a gun back on him. And then you see everybody starts pulling guns out. And it is hinted that towards one of the back cars here, the Predator is there. Because it's a dark car and you can see through the, you know, the door and everything. And he just sees his guns start coming out. And then Leona and Jerry, they pull out their guns and they start announcing themselves as police. At this point, the Predator is like, oh, well, all these people are strapped up. Why not? This is a this is a you know a, a full thing for me. Let's go. So he hops in there, and then uh, well, no, he's on top of the uh, he's on top of the the train. Yeah, isn't he? crawling. Yep. Yeah. So I think it was I think maybe it was hinted that he was back there, but it might have been a misdirect. Yeah. Um, but uh, he ends up hopping on top of the train, uh, jacking it up in a way that it starts messing with the the lighting, so it's kind of flickering. And uh, at this point, you know. Some people have started shooting some stuff off. Uh, Predator comes in there and starts laying waste to some of these guys. And Jerry tells Leona to start getting people out. So Leona starts getting the people out. They're pushing up the cars. They're going up further and further. And you just see Predator just laying waste to these guys in this train car. Uh, Even the guy who didn't want to give up his seat and initiated by pulling the gun gets killed. So it kind of shows you that it's like, yes, although... In our eyes, maybe he wasn't an antagonist, wasn't, would be more considered innocent. Uh, he was, you know, in the eyes of the Predator, a worthy opponent. You know, he had a weapon and, you know, there wasn't anything that stopped him from saying, you know, he, he kind of chose like, okay, I could attack you too, kind of deal. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so we, unfortunately, this leads into Jerry's death which uh, is tragic. It's definitely sucks to see that character go. Cause I, I did think that the, he was building good rapport throughout the story with Harrigan and the team and everything. Um, and I think that his death is pretty cool though, because you uh, for a minute there, I had forgotten about a scene that happens a little later on. So I thought maybe since they didn't find his body, I was like, maybe there's a chance that if Bill Paxton was still around, he could have come back in a later, later sequel. But no, unfortunately, uh, we see Jerry's unloading his pistol. He's like, what the hell are you kind of thing? And the Predator lays waste to him. We don't see it exactly at that moment. Train does end up coming to a stop. Leona ends up going back there to look for Jerry. She sees a bunch of people on the, while she's standing on the platform. Bunch of bodies, bunch of blood back there. And this is where we get a really interesting moment with this predator and it really expands the lore once again the predator grabs her while cloaked reveals itself lifts her up in the air by her neck and you know that he's he understands that she's armed as well and that he's going to kill her but then he uses his goggles his vision and he notices that there is a, a fetus and it's got a heartbeat and everything and we leave it at that it's not until Harrigan shows up and he starts going uh, to the crime scene he's running through and he sees Leona being pulled out that we realize the Predator didn't kill her. And that's when we kind of start to realize, OK, so they do have a quote. They do have a code of ethics, a code of honor where he's like, OK, you are pregnant. I am not going to kill you. OK, because like they, it's like they, they won't do that. You are not sport to them at that point. You're not fair game. Um, and you kind of get this great sequence where he goes down, Harrigan goes down there looking for Jerry. He sees that the carts, the, the train car is all fucked up. Um, and then he notices, I think, doesn't he hear something down the the way a little bit? He goes down there and, you know, he sees the predator. I don't think he's cloaked at this point, but he's holding up, he's holding up Jerry's head and he rips it from, rips his head from his shoulders throws the body down. He goes, Jerry, and he starts chasing after him and the predator takes off all in all. I think this is one of the best sequences in the movie from point A to point B there. I think that you get a lot of great development. You get a lot of good action and it's just really unique seeing predator taking people on in a subway. Cause I mean, you are stuck in a metal tube with this thing. Yeah. And from what I've read that this, uh, the subway scene is actually taken from the comic book and, uh, it was they loved it so much from the comic that they wanted a uh, reason to put it into the actual film. And I think it does work. I enjoy it. I think some of the the, you know, seeing the predator crawl uh, on top of the subway 
uh, I don't, I, the shot isn't wide enough for me. It kind of feels like so close up. Um, I don't know. It just seems, um, like it, it could have been done a little bit better. I do enjoy the actual, um, moments of in the actual subway itself. Um, the kind of going back, like where the lights flickering on and off, you can't really see. And he is dispatching so many different, um, riders that have weapons. He doesn't really care. Um, as long as you have a weapon, he will take you out. Um, and the focus on Jerry, I think is so well done where that character, I think, again, unlimited potential that was never fully lived up to, but they make the ending that, that his death scene, uh, feel, you feel for that character where, um, you know, he comes in as this kind of renegade rogue cop. Um, and people think he's kind of looking out for himself, but he's not, he really is lo looking to be a team player. And if you look through this whole film where he says he will, um, you know, make sure that Tony Pope isn't, you know, he kind of takes him out of the game where yeah. he says, you know, I'm your biggest fan and you know, all this stuff where it's like, he really is a team player. And you, you really see that at the end. The one thing that they kind of cut from the screenplay is he really has this sentimental dialogue, uh, in his own way with Leona before they get on the, uh, the subway where she tells him that she's pregnant and they kind of have this whole thing where he gives her reassur re reassurance in a sense. Um, and I think like, honestly, I would have preferred that dialogue be left in and because the unveiling for as an audience isn't really like gratifying, gratifying, I don't think. Uh, but like to kind of leave that in, I think would have made Jerry's death that mean that much more because he is protecting her and the life that is in her. Mm. Um, and to kind of have him knowing that I think would have given so much development in death to that character himself. So I, I think that would have been interesting. And I do love the unveiling though, when the predator does kind of use his different vision, uh, to look, to see that she is carrying a newborn because in the screenplay, she screams out, I'm pregnant. And I think that would have been kind of too much fisted, mm -hmm. um, where it's like kind of having him use his different again. And I think that adds where it's like, he just doesn't see in thermal, you know what I mean? He can change the different visions on his helmet to see exactly what is going on there. So I think that was interesting. I do enjoy it again it tears your heart out to see Jerry strung up like that uh, because that character was so great. Um, but I think it really does move along. I think, again, that subway scene is probably one of the best in this film. It's so memorable. It is one of the things where anyone says anything about Predator 2, I go back to that subway scene. Um, so, yeah, I think this one, great set piece. Uh, definitely worthy of the film. I'm glad they put this in here because it feels unique uh, to its own. You know, you can really pick this out from the original. 100%. Um, one thing I want to touch on, and then I might just pass it over to you to wrap us up here because I tend to run things a little more long winded uh, oh, okay. if you're up for it. Um, but uh, I just because I feel like we've gone an hour and a half and we're not even out of the first segment yet. So yeah, I'm just like, I'm so sorry. It's going to be a long one. So I hope you're in for it. But uh, there's so much to discuss, to be there honest. There is. I mean, really, I think that this is just an awesome movie. And I mean, we'll get into it with a wrap up about how I really feel. But I think you're getting the impression that not only were we big Predator fans, we're big Predator 2 fans. We like this movie a lot. We're um, into it. A little piece that I always wanted to touch, touch base with. This was a big part of when I was doing research and when I was putting notes together for this, because normally how our show is segmented out is we each get a pick. We kind of alternate. So like, you know, uh, I had Sinister 2 last week or last show. That was my pick. So I had to do the bulk of the research on that. Luke is always the script guy. He's real good at getting through that and kind of pulling out details and stuff. But for the most part, I, I got a lot of the information on that one. Um, this was more of a conjoined pick for us. Uh, we had decided because of Prey coming out, we wanted to do this. So we kind of shared the load with our research. Um, one of the things that I got to find in here that I was always curious about, I had to actually independently look this up. This wasn't something that was just in fun facts on IMDb or, you know, just something that I had to go to the Predator Wiki forum to find mm -hmm. information about and then re-verify it a couple of times. But um, talking specifically about Leona and her pregnancy, now, as a kid, I can remember watching this, and I thought it was Bill Paxton's baby. I think it's just because, as young as I was to see this, I know it doesn't play at all in the film now, but when I was younger, I guess just because they kind of had that camaraderie and they were yeah. kind of nice with each other uh, as the film went on, 
my head just kind of connected the dots because I knew she was pregnant. And I was like, well, it has to be Bill Paxton. Yeah. So I'm just like, that's how it has to be because they're buddies, right? They're, they're, they're lovers. No. Um, as it turns out, originally, there was a greater slub, uh, subplot regarding Leona's pregnancy. The scene where Harrigan meets Jerry at the bar to discuss keys was originally part of a longer scene where the officers celebrate Leona's birthday. There, her husband Rick was introduced during this sequence, although neither of them knew Leona was pregnant at the time. Before he talked with Jerry, Harrington briefly chatted with Leona, who reveals one of the bodies from the massacre at the beginning of the film was missing, likely the corpse hanging from the roof that the city hunter is seen dragging away. So towards the opening of the film, I think we kind of glazed over it a little bit. After they start uh, disbanding and leaving the room, we see one of the bodies get taken off. So that's what they're kind of referencing there. Unfortunately, the whole scene was reduced to just the conversation between Harrington and and Jerry in the final version of the film, although it does appear in the novelization. Um, so again, they had this all structured out, like you've been saying in the original draft of that script you read, where they were going to kind of flush out her being pregnant a little bit more and kind of play yep. into that. I think ultimately, because I've seen it how it is, it still works for me the way they do this. I think it just, again, the really the best part of it is the fact that the predator doesn't kill her. And is it does show they have morals, they have a code of honor and everything. Um, but I do think that it would have been a lot better to get a little bit more backstory on some of these guys. Like, yeah. I want to see Leona's husband. I want to know. I don't want to be that kid sitting there being like, is it Bill Paxton's baby or is it not? Because I think that if it's the biggest drawback of this movie is that we don't get enough time with any of these characters other than yep. Harrigan. And even him to an extent. Like you said, we don't get much of him other than his work ethic and what he's doing. Do I think that the film overall suffers from it? Only a tiny bit, but like it could have been so much deeper. We could have gotten a lot more. And I think that it would have made us care even more about these characters because going back to the first film, you don't really need that because they're soldiers. It's a simple story. Uh, But this film, they're trying to do a lot more. They're trying to flush it out. They're trying to show you a whole city everybody's got dynamics everybody's got kind of an arc per se but it just kind of seems like they leave a lot of those arcs on the table instead of completing them yeah and you know and you say you think it only affects it a little bit i think i'm on the opposite end there uh where i think it affects it a lot in, in the terms of quality because i look at this film and it's like i think moving it to the city absolutely works i think the predators look works i think the kills work um I think the characters in general work, but I don't, I, there's not much there in terms of the character arc. And I think that's probably the biggest, biggest strike on this film where it's like, I think you created some interesting characters. Um, I think you could have done some fun stuff, but it's like, you know, if this was a three hour movie, I think we could be looking at an A plus here, but it wasn't. <laughs> and I think maybe they, they focused on maybe the wrong things, or maybe they put in too many characters. I mean, looking at that cast, I mean, how do you go wrong? How is this not uh, an adequate, you know, like up there in terms of rating uh, to the original? Uh, I don't know. It's like the cast is there. The elements are there. The story's there. It just, it feels something's missing. And the only thing I contribute to that to is the actual character development uh, in the actual film. So that is actually a great point. I can bring this fact up. Uh, what you just said there, because Arnold Schwarzenegger said no to Predator 2 in 1990 because of dispute over money, according to the producer John Davis. It was over an additional 250000 which the studio refused to pay. Other rumors suggest that the refusal of the script was due to having to choose between his Terminator, his role in this, or Terminator 2. I put in little quotations, although I do appreciate and love Predator 2, I think it's safe to say that Arnie made the right call because Terminator 2 is just a masterpiece in every sense. Now, I bring that up because I think it's very clear that you can see that when Arnie said no, a lot of the excitement from the producers and the people behind it funding it really started to fade. And I think that's why... Yes, again, I think that's why you started to see 
uh, the way this was handled and the way that they kind of just decided to do away with some of this stuff. Because they're just like, well, if we can't get Arnie, then, I mean, what's the point? Because, yeah. again, Hollywood's mindset is, well, we made this successful, let's just do it again. Um, but they never seem to get the idea that it's like, well, no, it's, it's still successful. I mean, people are showing up for the Predator, so if you just tell a good story with good characters, you can put somebody else in there. And, yeah. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but because Danny Glover you know, this really was, you know, one of his very few leading man performances. Maybe they didn't have the faith in it. If you would have put a Patrick Swayze or um, even a Mel Gibson in this role, do you think that they might have given them the time and the money and the effort to, you know, kind of keep that story moving? Maybe, maybe they would have. Um, I don't think it's right because I think that Danny Glover kills this and I think he's awesome in the movie, but you know, it just goes to show you where the studio's head was at at the time, yeah. where it's like they're just more so focused on, well, this worked. Let's recreate it and put it out there again. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think that it's I, I think they were focused on spending the least amount of money and getting the biggest return, which became probably a pretty big issue. Um, I, I don't know. Should we, are, are we saving stuff for production notes? I'm assuming I don't we know. are, there's still a lot that we can go over here, but I think okay. if we want to just kind of, if you want to put a, a bookend here, give us the last sec segment, cause you're going to sum it up a lot quicker than I am. Yeah. I am so long winded. I apologize everyone. Um, go ahead and bookend us the ending section of this film between Harrigan and keys. And then the final section of the movie. Okay. Perfect. All right, so after after um, he sees Jerry yeah, being dismantled by the Predator, he gives chase. Um, as he gives chase, he ends up in the Slaughterhouse District, as uh, Jerry had mentioned earlier on in the film. As he gets there, he is blindsided by a giant pickup truck and ripped out of the, the driver's seat, which is, um, it turns out it's the CIA agents, or thought to be CIA agents, um, and he is um, taken into a little trailer where he meets up with uh, Peter Keys, who lays it all out on the table for him as to what exactly they are doing there. Shows him some footage of the Predator and what they've been doing. They've been tracking him uh, to the Slaughterhouse District. They know he does come here every few days to feed. Uh, so he tells them their plan of going in and um, uh uh, basically attacking this predator. Um, so they're all suited up. Uh, they have their thermal suits on, so the predator cannot track their heat signatures because uh, so they, they believe that that's the only uh, uh, vision that he has at that time. Um, and they also, I think they flooded the uh, the, the slaughterhouse with uh, UV particles or something to um, conform to his body so he will become visible. So as they go in, this is very kind of aliens kind of... Uh, tracking feels like so as they go in hunting for the predator he's playing into their trap until he realizes something's a little off here um it turns out he's got multiple different kinds of vision and he can see their lights so as they are trying to find him he jumps down and totally destroys everybody at this point um harrigan knows what's going on so he escapes from the trailer hops into the slaughterhouse um ready to fight and battle this uh this predator as they come face to face, um, they do uh, a little battle, and um, Harrigan. And I think this is where his helmet comes off. Maybe I can't. Yeah, remember. Harrigan takes the helmet off at this point. Takes Once the helmet he off, subdues um, him momentarily, and then he gets thrown across the room as he thinks he is about to be killed. Gary Busey, Peter Keys oh, pops back up, ready to fight him, um, and uh, he's got his little. Uh, what is that? A freeze gun? I don't know what he's using there. Yeah, it's um, some kind of a freeze ray of some nitrogen, sort. Nitrogen, uh, Terminator Two kind of freezing gun there. Uh, but um, uh, so he's he's working him back a little bit, but then he loses uh loses him for a moment, and this is where we get that damn smart disc cutting through all that meat and through Peter Keys, which I love that kill. Oh, it's um, very good. Uh, this ends up on the rooftop of the slaughterhouse as uh the. Predator gets knocked off the top of the the building as he's hanging off the side because he's been injured previously by Harrigan as he got shot a few times. Um, he tries to activate his self-destruct uh, little wrist gauntlet, but uh, knowing, as Peter Keys had told 
uh, Harrigan what this was. He grabs the smart disc and chops off the Predator's uh, I think it's his left hand. Um, yes, I want to I want to freeze right there because there's a couple points that I just want to make. I promise I'll make them quick. Uh, number one, I love when Keys and Harrington, I kind of alluded to this earlier, when they get together and Keys starts discussing uh, the events of the first film and they kind of start talking about how that all went down. They also mention a couple other events that we haven't seen uh, that have happened over the years involving Predators. So you can see that they're really in deep with all of this. Um, I appreciate the callback to you are one ugly motherfucker. Only issue I have with it is, and I guess I can kind of give this away because they've been cussing up a storm the whole fucking movie, but like it almost seems too deliberate to have the predator be the one to finish the line. Yeah. Because it's kind of like, oh, okay, so like how does that predator know that Arnie and that they said that, you know what I mean? But yeah. like I can forgive it. Um, and then, yes, I think that like the, the kill of Peter keys is just awesome. I think that, it, you know, I, I really think that we've kind of glazed over it. We'll talk a little bit more about him in cast. I think we'll have to highlight him a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I think Gary Busey kills this role too, as he does with most of his, uh, eighties to, you know, late nineties roles or yeah, early nineties. I think, roles. I think it was perfect casting, which he wasn't even the first choice here, which will be interesting to talk about. Yes. Um, so go ahead. Um, so as um, he knocks him down or chops off his his arm, he falls down into an apartment building um, into a bathroom of an elderly couple. And this is where we see him take out a couple more devices that we've never seen before. Um, he creates this kind of blue gel that he rubs on his wounds, um, letting out a nice howl um, that we haven't really heard too much from the Predator before. Um, he injects himself with um, a syringe. Uh, as Harrigan is trying to make his way down the building, uh, the, the Predator knocks through a bunch of walls as Harrigan uh, gives chase, uh, which leads them to um, an elevator shaft, which the Predator has went down, and Harrigan, of course, afraid of heights, decides to follow him down. Um, and it drops through a giant hole, which ends up uh, near the Predator spaceship, which is where the uh, final battle takes place in a gaseous little arena there um they battle a little bit where you think uh the predators finally got harrigan but no 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 harrigan takes out that smart disc and jams it right into the predators midriff and takes him right down and then like i had said before a bunch of predators show up uh when we see that little plasma caster on uh on harrigan's uh what is it midsection there mm -hmm. um and uh he thinks he's about to battle he says who's next and uh, it turns out the Predators are there to uh, pay their respects and say, hey, man, you got one of us. Uh, so here, take out this nifty gun that I got from 1718, and I'm going to toss it to you, buddy. And uh, as the uh, Predators make their way into space, uh, Harrigan comes back out and tells uh, little Baldwin boy there that, um, hey, these It'll Predators are going to be back, so you might get your shot. Mm. And we roll credits. Yeah, it's a great it's a great way to end the film. I think the whole third act is awesome. I, I really don't have many issues with it. Uh, I think that the film is super famous for giving us that that final section uh, where we just get to see the you know we get to see the alien head and everything, um, and it really does a lot to expand the lore. Um, I'm not going to get in it, into it now because we do need to move into another section here. Um, but there will be a little nod back towards the end of this uh, from a Dark Horse comic about said gun. So I think without further ado, we've talked plenty enough about the synopsis of this film. You know, you had our brief notes. You've had our in-depth thoughts on this movie as we've gone through each section and expressed our love and admiration for Predator. We've still TV. got many thoughts. We do. Uh, but now let's get to the behind the scenes on this baby with Behind the Mask. It's almost time, kids. The clock is ticking. Be in front of your TV sets for the horathon, and remember the big giveaway at nine. Don't miss it, and don't forget to wear your masks. The clock is ticking. It's almost time. Awesome. So getting into this section, of course, we're going to talk about the production of Predator 2 a bit. Um, and this movie, again, like we kind of discussed, uh, was a little bit maligned with the fact that Arnie didn't want to come back. 
So yeah. it was a little bit of a money dispute. It was a little bit of a Sophie's choice there with having to be like Predator or Terminator. Again, ultimately, I think he made the best decision that he could. Terminator 2 is a gem. Uh, I do appreciate this movie, but if it became this or Terminator 2, I feel like we'd be living in a totally different world when it comes to cinema, just for how much that movie uh, gave us when it comes to special effects uh, and just overall storytelling and action films in general. Uh, would yeah. you agree with me on that one? I think that that's, that's pretty universally understood. Uh, yeah, that he made the right choice in taking Terminator 2? Yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, you know... I, I guess if I'm the, I'm one making um, decisions here, I'd be like, what can we do to get Arnie back on board here? If that's if that's the route we're going to go. Um, also, I wanted to bring this up. I don't I haven't heard you mention it. Um, I don't hear many people mention it. And again, unfortunately, I was running across things and prep for right before we got on here. So I didn't get the chance to actually dive deep into it. But I did want to bring it up because we talk about the money dispute here with Arnold. Um, uh, there was also, uh, from what I'm understanding, a creative dispute here, mm -hmm. um, in terms of he was going to be that Peter Keys role, um, and he did not enjoy that. Um, mm -hmm. you, you're privy to that, I'm assuming. Yes, I have a little bit about that, but you can, there, there's also, there was another, uh, take on it too, that I actually highlight a little deeper. So if you have some more on that, feel free. Um, I, I I'm just looking that. at that because I hadn't heard too much about it. Um, I think that would have been such an interesting dynamic to, because from my understanding, this would have been more of a split dual lead role between Harrigan and the Peter Keys, which would have been Dutch if, yeah, if, if things had worked out. So I, I think to have that kind of dual Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny Glover kind of lead uh, duo there, I think would have been very interesting. And that dynamic of Dutch being the hero in the first one and kind of almost creating uh, I don't think it would have been full fledged unlikable Peter Keys, but kind of a little bit of an unlikable Dutch, kind of obsessed with capturing a predator, uh, and by any means necessary. I think would have been a very interesting dynamic there. Um, I just don't think at that time, uh, you know, Arnold was at that point in his career where it's like, no, I'm the hero. Um, I'm, you know, the good guy in all of this. I'm. Ne I don't want to do that. I think maybe nowadays he would be more open to that because he does take sometimes take a little more interesting roles uh, than he used to. So I, I, I think it was a missed opportunity. I really would have loved that dynamic. I think that script, again, I've seen the second script, uh, second draft, which Peter Keyes was already introduced. I can only imagine that that first script was the Dutch character and I have not found it or uncovered it. I mean, if anyone has that, I would love to read it because uh, I can only assume that he's in that one because I would love to see uh, the kind of mashup and what kind of different scenes are in that and kind of the interplay that those two would have would have undergone. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. And I do have another take. I don't know what iteration of the script this part comes from, but in my research, I was able to confirm that this was kind of the meta that they were going with, uh, with, I, I think this would still considered to be canon. Um, I mean, who knows at this point, they've kind of really racked themselves in a hard spot, especially after the predator with, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get in the backstory of that cause we got so much that we're already covering, but at one point he was supposed to show up in the movie. Uh, they also show the staff from AVP in the movie. So it's like, who, who the hell really knows at this point, what's going on with this franchise or what's canon yeah. and what's not. But if we're just talking Predator 2, um, as I said earlier, this was directed by Stephen Hopkins, um, you know, and that's one of those things where he kind of came on after John McTiernan. Uh, he didn't join up. I mean, John McTiernan was interested. Uh, this was something that he was interested in doing. But uh, after his fee uh, from Die Hard went up uh, to two million. He decided to direct this. He decided not to. He declined to direct this movie because the executives wanted to keep the budget as the same as the first. So, unfortunately, he wasn't able to do it because, um, you know, he just didn't think that he was being compensated correctly. Which, you know, he did Die Hard. He did Predator. The man wants some more money. It, it makes total sense. You know, you get. And it's Hollywood. It's a business. And I know that sucks to say because sometimes it doesn't work out for us as fans. But yeah. in, if it's John McTiernan, I think the guy earned it. And I think it sucks that the studio didn't throw it in there. But I mean, it's something that 
you know, he's went on to have a great lavish career. So, I mean, like, it's not something that really hurt him in the long run. Uh, Wasn't he, just he in jail? Gets... Was he? I didn't know that, actually. Uh, maybe look that up. I don't want to go on record on that, but I thought he was. Okay, well, that that is news to me. I, I did not come I across I thought it was that. tax evasion. Again, oh, I, I okay. could be mixing this up with someone, but I, I thought it was him. I don't know 100%. So yeah. we may have to edit this all out. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm just um, throwing random stuff out there. Stephen Hopkins, though, uh, he was just coming off of a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. I believe it was was Five, it the, the, dream the Dream Child. Yes, it was The Dream Child. He just came off of that. Uh, he's known for doing things like Blown Away with Jeff Bridges, uh, a film near and dear to my heart that uh, we would have to cover at some point on some show. And you need to see. And I'm, I'm going to be upset if you don't like the movie. Uh, the Ghost and the Darkness. Val Kilmer. Uh, oh, yeah, Michael Douglas. I know. I love that fucking movie. Uh, and then he did the uh, he did a few episodes of uh, 24 and uh, mostly relegated to TV stuff by this point. He's done Shameless and things like that. Um, and he is slated to do a TV movie. It says for 2020, it was The Dark Tower with Michael Rooker. I don't know anything about this. I can't find anything more on it, but it's on IMDb. So, is what it is, I guess. <laughs> so, um, does it exist? It does exist. I mean, they got okay. a full cast and everything, but like, I don't know where this premiered. It says it's a TV movie. Uh, I mean, kind of is what it is. But uh, yeah, so he had a great career. I mean, like, he's definitely done. He's got some misses in there. Lost in Space is one of them. Um, so the '90s version. Um, so it's just one of those things where it's like, he, he's just kind of one of those directors that the studio just kind of throws in there every once in a while to kind of get a project done. And this yeah. kind of honestly feels like that was their intent here, but I feel like he was able to pull it off and bring a little bit of personality to this movie. So I, I give him all the credit in the world on that one. Um, this was a written by the original writers of predator. So they definitely got their hands in here. I believe, especially in that first draft from when I, I did my research on the, they really got a good pass over that. But of course, Stephen Hopkins came in, made some edits. The studio had some people come in and make some edits. Um, as you do normally with big franchises like this, studios get very handsy with stuff. So, you know, you kind of had that going in there. And obviously you had Joel Silver coming back as a director, John Davis, um, you know, all these other guys, Lawrence Gordon, who I don't think he was in the first one. I could be wrong on that, but um, he was another producer on here. And of course, produced that. 20th century Fox. So, you know, you kind of, it's a little weird in my opinion that they had such a tough time with this, but I think it really all comes back down to um, it losing a lot of steam when Arnie didn't come back. Yeah. Which again, that sucks because it's like, you know, you, you have clearly have a creature and, you know, a concept that people enjoy. I just think that, you know, we hindsight's 2020. And I mean, like, we have the luxury of seeing what this, you know, franchise and this creature would go on to do and what it would become where now we're sitting here in 2022 and we have companies like NECA producing figurines, like highly detailed, you know, figurines. And, you know, there were comic books and video games shortly after that, all kinds of stuff that they just really weren't privy to or really giving too much stake into i don't think they expected predator to still have movies coming out in 2022 um yeah. at that point but i still think that the fact that so much steam got lost when arnie didn't sign on and i mean i guess with john mctiernan not coming on but that was more them a them problem and less of a and him not wanting to return yeah. um you know i guess that just kind of shows the a little bit of irresponsibility when it comes to this, uh, how this was handled, yeah. I feel like a lot of things came down to just money being the bottom line, which I understand filmmaking's a business, but I mean, I really just don't think they knew what they had. Yeah. And, and that's where it's like, um, I don't know. I, I think it was so many missteps here because I know that I, I know what was it? 250,000. You said was mm. a dispute. And so yes. from my understanding, Arnold was not thrilled that John McKiernan was not returning. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, I feel like if you make the play for John McTiernan, 
you give him what he wants, his asking price. You have him on board. Is that two hundred fifty thousand really going to matter to Arnie? You know what I mean? Where it's like, it's like that could have been a deciding factor. I'd be like, I I want to do it, but if he's he's directing, I trust him. We've worked together. I'm going to come on board. We're going to do maybe work to the script, whatever we're going to do. And I feel like as a studio, no matter what, you you get your major players in place because you can't buy the marketing that you would have having Arnold attached to a film in the early 90s. You just can't mm-hmm. do it. No, so I mean, it's like one of the greats of all time it, when it comes to that. It It's already an A-list film. So it's like it, it, the people that will go see it just – okay, can you imagine – the amount of people that said Predator Two exists, Arnold's in it. Oh, he's not. I'm not gonna go see it. Exactly. And I hate people that do that stuff, but like, yeah, it's just how it is. Unfortunately, it's human yeah. nature. So, especially Arnold in the early '90s, he was such a deciding factor. People would go see his movie. People probably went and saw Junior just because it had Arnold just because he's in it. in it. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's like I-, I feel like if you're gonna make a play to make this a real franchise you're going to get your major players in because I think not having those major players return was the reason why we didn't see anything from predator in the rest of the nineties. You know what I mean? Where it's like, there was a long delay there. And I think there were so many missteps from there, not getting this right. Um, So, cause you know, Danny Glover is great, but does he feel less than in terms of an action star? I think so. So I think this kind of, this kind of downgraded the franchise in a sense where it's like, Maybe I'll see it when it's on VHS, but I don't want to go to the theater to see it, you know, or I'll wait till it's on cable. And, you, you know, know so it's like, then become must see at that point. What was also interesting, and I have this in my notes too, is that this movie came out um, on uh, November 21st, 1990. Kind of an odd time to release a Predator movie, I feel like, you know, yeah. especially in the setting of this film. Um, I know that's kind of trivial when in the long, in the grand scheme of things, but I, you know, you have certain times a year that you release certain things. There's always like, there's kind of this, if you're into the movie space, you kind of understand that like that December, November, you know, I'd say even late October area is very much uh, the award season kind of stuff where you get a lot more of the people that are gunning for Oscars. You get a lot more of that stuff. It just doesn't seem like the right spot to be releasing a predator movie as to where like the first film was released on June 12th. Like, seems like a great time. Prey yeah. is coming out in August, which seems a little late, but it's still summer. I mean, like, it's still yeah. that time. You could even release it in October. I'd still say that's a good time. Yeah. But, like, once you get in those later months, you kind of have, and I don't know how the setting was back in the 90s for that. Maybe it wasn't as structured as it is now, because now you get into those December, November areas. And I'm thinking, like, you get Oscar films and you get big tentpole massive blockbusters like star wars or harry potter or something like that that kind of give you those we're trying to get the whole family in the theater for this yeah. predator is not a movie you're going to get the whole family involved in you know what i mean this is rated r too isn't it, it is rated r so and it's not like you're going to get all that right then and there you know what i mean and that's where it's like i know you said it went through so many cuts wasn't it going to be nc-17 in some instances so yes i was going to bring that up just now oh. is that this movie was a uh, recall recut over 20 times according to stephen hopkins because of more graphic shots of mutilated bodies decapitations by the and decapitations by the predator uh the film was initially given an nc-17 rating so they had to cut this movie over 20 times to get it down to that r rating which is like why are you releasing this in november then it's why not a not? family movie you no, know what it's i mean not. It's, it's it's like it's not going to hit all those demographics it's not a as they would say in the industry it's not a four quadrant film you know, it's yeah. not the rise of Skywalker or fucking Spider-Man, which you can get away with that because you're going to hit everything. You're going to be able to get kids and families and parents and grandparents into these movies. You know what I mean? You're not going to get all that. It's it, it's this is going to be primarily adult males and, uh, you know, young adults and teenagers that are going to go see this movie. This really does feel like. You were you're saying they kind of lost confidence in it, where I was like, we don't even know what to do here, so we're just going to put it out and hopefully someone watches it. It really does feel like an afterthought in a sense, where, again, I think not getting those major players in place really hurt this, and they were kind of just like, what do we do here? We made this film. Uh, we're obviously having problems getting it out, and maybe those so many cuts, 
I don't know how long of a delay that becomes where it's like, oh, no, you have to keep going back to the drawing board and you have to cut this and you have to get rid of that and you have to reroute this where it's like, I don't know, maybe it missed an original date that they were shooting for and they kind of just were like, it, it becomes one of those things where, oh, go, God damn, is this, is this okay to put out? Okay, it's rated R, great, just just go with it. Give it a November release date and let's put this on the in the rear view mirror and not be bothered with it again. Yeah, and then with that, that kind of process, I mean, like, maybe they didn't want to touch a Predator film. You know what I mean? Or it just became such a thing where it's like, uh, this isn't really what we signed up for. So to kind of give you some more context here to kind of leave production after this, um, with it coming out on November 21st, uh, the film premiered at number four at the box office. Um, and granted, you know, I didn't do all the math for inflation to see what n- those numbers would equate to today's box office. Uh, but the movie um, was, it, it grossed over $8 million, just a little over $8 million that weekend. Um, and it was just behind Dances with Wolves, Three Men and a Little Lady, and Rocky Five, uh, and Home Alone. So you can see where this movie was stuck behind. I mean, Rocky, four quadrant film. I don't even care if it's the fifth movie. So it's like one of those things where it's like, you're going to hit a lot of people with that. Yeah. Uh, even a lot of crossover there with predator being an Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, first film there and kind of having that impression with the franchise. And then yeah. Sylvester Stallone, their audience is crossed all the time. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of have that. Um, don't know much about three men and a little lady uh, home alone. Good film. Like, I mean, it's just what home alone or three men and a lady, three men and a little lady. Okay. Sequel the three men and a baby. That's what I thought. But uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Wait, there you go. Um, but Home Alone, I mean, massive juggernaut. Like, I mean, what are you going to do? That movie literally came out the same weekend, if not the one before. And then Dances with Wolves. Again, like I said, huge Oscar contender. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you putting this movie out right now? Just didn't make any sense. And this I think that was just... honestly like any audience that you could think of that would. Um um want to see this film kind of had that craving already filled by any of those films that were coming before this i mean like you said that rocky five probably deflated that audience where it was like if this was arnold and predator 2 i think this versus rocky five people would have been in the theater to see predator 2 yeah i think that would have been something to put that against yeah that would have been an interesting weekend at the box office but it being danny glover versus sylvester stallone Sylvester Stallone is still that action juggernaut. Yeah. No matter if it's Rocky Five. It's only 1990. He's still killing it. Like Sylvester Stallone was literally probably killing it at the box office until the early to mid 2000s. Yeah. So the guy had legs. Like he kept things moving. And coming off Rocky Four, I mean, still. (laughs) That's America's movie, baby. What are you talking about? Um, It's still still a strong franchise at that point. I mean, yeah, yeah. Rocky Five takes a downturn, but it is still going into Rocky Five. That is still a strong franchise. Yeah. Um, And then I'll kind of get into the the budget for this movie. So the film itself costs uh, it's it's there's no hard number, but it's anywhere between 20 to 30 million. In its entire run, uh, it made 57.1 mil. So it made its money back. But obviously, you know, you spend 20 to 30. And I know the times were different back then. Movie tickets were a lot cheaper back then. Um, but still they 8 still million return. for Predator. I think they'd at least be a little happier if it at least crossed 10. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know it's close, but it's like in the grand scheme of things, like you said, with like Rocky Five and Home Alone and stuff coming out, it's like, what are you going to do? Like, I mean, like it kind of shows, but again, hindsight's 2020, but I feel like 20th century Fox shot themselves in the foot with that one. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just for comparison though, um, we had, uh, predator one only cost 18 million and that's with Arnie. But I mean, at that time it was 84. So you're still kind of climbing at that point. Uh, it grossed 98.3 in its, uh, you know, in its entire run. So that's a big decrease coming down yeah. from that. So that's why you probably didn't see, um, you know, that's why you didn't see another Predator movie for so long. And I didn't add this to my notes, but just because we're doing it, I'm going to pull up the opening weekend numbers 
for the first predator. Um, oh, just it, to it, speak. Did you know what it was going against as well? Or you? Uh, I can kind of. I can try to. I can see here. Um, yeah, even in the opening weekend, Predator made twelve million dollars. Okay, so it was. It was a pretty big decrease. It was second only to Beverly Hills Cop Two. Okay. Yeah. So. So yeah, and I mean, but uh, I guess I could try to see what else it was uh, going against here. Um, but yeah, I mean. Give me your thoughts on that there, Luke. I mean, like, it, it kind of seems like this movie was just dumped and given no legs yeah. to stand on. Really. I, I don't think there was an... I think by the time that this came out, there may have not even been that expectation there. Um, where I think we talked about it on... Uh, I don't know if it was a Sunday Scaries or a Splattercast. I can't remember, but we had talked... I, I had mentioned that I feel like Predator is essentially a B franchise right now. Um where I, I don't think it was looked at. I think, honestly, b before Predator 2, uh, it, by the time it came out, was already looked at. It's like, uh, you know, it is what it is. If we're not going to have Arnie back, if this isn't going to be an Arnie-driven uh, franchise, we don't want it. You know, so it's like, we committed to it. Let's see what's out there. And by the time it was already out there, they were like, you know, we've had our fill. We, we don't really want to revisit this anymore. Maybe at a later date we will, but you know, it, it just wasn't there at, at a point to, to even think about in hindsight, to think about the, the kind of um, fanfare uh, that AVP had gotten uh, when it had come out after not have seeing a film for so long, it was very surprising because, you know, it, it feels like predator is very more uh, underground where it's like, it's a dark horse comic. It's not, you know, one of the main kind of comic books, and the kind of lore had spun itself probably starting what in 89 and kind of creating its own underground thing where it's like, you know, that was free internet, you know, it wasn't like mm -hmm. forums coming up with their own fan theories, talking about predator things you want to see. It was very much a small, small community at that point. So, you know, I, I don't think like it was like, we're going to put all our eggs in this basket. You know, I, I think the studio was probably happy to uh, put this one out there and just have their palate cleansed and be like, okay, we're not going to revisit that for a very long time. I agree, but I'm going to move us into our next segment here. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, in a little segment we call cast and crew, but we call the segment uh, "You Are All My Children." <laughs> great um i wonder if we'll ever get around to that i'm sure we will uh that movie interesting interesting is that the second one that is the second one it's a great like quote it. you'd like the second one i haven't I, seen I, it in so long so okay, I don't yeah know. i mean it's different I, they're still trying to figure out the form for freddie at that point mm -hmm. I, I think it's a lot darker um, but yeah, we're talking Predator 2, not Nightmare on Elm Street 2. So let's just do all the sequels. Let's talk Critters 2, Mick Garris. We'll get there. Um, so obviously we've talked the cast. We've talked about them a great bit. But uh, if I'm going to run through everybody, we have Danny Glover, Gary Busey, uh, Ruben, Ruben Blades, uh, Maria Gochita Alonso. Yes. Maria or is it Conchita Maria? Alonso. My bet. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Come on, um, Bill Paxton and uh, Robert Davey. And of course, returning uh, again, doing a fantastic job. Uh, one of the best when it comes to anytime you need a big monster or just a really tall person in general, Kevin Peter Hall returning as the predator. Um, I love that he at least got to do this again because he kills it in that first film. Um, so, I mean, like just having him come back and throw it, it's a no brainer. And I mean, yeah. I'm sure he was eager to sign right back on to play the predator. And, but yeah, uh, this is a, like you were saying earlier, this is a pretty stacked cast. Yeah. And um, to kind of go through them, I, I, I you know, I, I think Danny Glover's great in this. Again, comparing him to Arnie, he's less than. And I think that kind of created a problem. Um, Gary Busey plays to a T his character perfect. Um, again, I would have loved to, again, we talk about not enough for these characters. Peter Keyes, I really would have loved to have seen a little more from him. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think he's he's a great character. Um, you know, you hate him throughout everything, but then that turning point in, in the slaughterhouse where he pops up and he's like, you know, uh, I love his confidence in that where he's like, he's getting his ass kicked basically, and he pops back up and he looks at uh, Harrigan and he goes, "I'm gonna save your ass." It's like, what are you talking about, man? You've been getting your ass handed to you. Um, I guess he kind of does. He gives him a few extra minutes there to get away. Yeah. <laughs> But I love that, you know, it's like you think he's going to get he's going to get the predator, you know, and I really believe that, you know, and I think that's attributed to Gary Busey's acting, which is his um, I, I had read that this is his first appearance after his uh, his big injury. Um, oh, really? Yeah. I actually so, didn't come across that. But, yeah, that that's unfortunate. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, I was glad, glad to see him back. You know, I, I still think he had those chops at that point. Um, so. You know, we talk about Silver Bullet on here all the time, but, um, you know, the dude is just a dynamic actor. I love him. Oh, absolutely. I 100% agree. I think that, you know, we've already talked to him at, about him at length, but yeah, if we're going to highlight anybody in this section, I do want to highlight Gary Busey. Um, I mean, he is going to pop up so many more times on this show um, and just in conversation because the dude has just one of those careers where it's like he is truly one of the best character actors uh, yeah. around and that we've had. Um, you know, obviously with his accident and things, it has prevented him from kind of keeping that career going. Um, I know, unfortunately, he's kind of become the butt of a lot of jokes as we've gone along for some people, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, but and I mean, I guess it just makes it hard for him to continue on. Uh, I doing think people what he was forget able to his do. body of work. You know what I mean? They do. Because like this, his run from like the early 80s through the 90s, man, is like so good. Silver yeah. bullet, point break, you know, you can even lethal weapon. You know, he's a great bad guy in that. Like there are so many fantastic roles that he gives. I I only wish I could know, wish we could know what he'd be doing today had he not suffered such a tragic accident that, you know, makes it a little bit, his, his day-to-day isn't the easiest. Yeah. But the fact that he still tries to show up in some media and still does some things here and there, you know, God bless him. Uh, I still respect the hell out of the man. I think he's a wonderful actor. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, he's somebody that will will be on here singing his praises uh, as we go along. Um, Danny Glover, again, we highlighted him a little bit earlier, just saying, you know, what a, you know, even though it was a, a Goliath task to yeah. take on to follow up Arnie as a leading man in predator. Uh, I think he does a great job. He's definitely a different dynamic than what we would be expecting. Um, he isn't, you know, there's a buff ripped soldier. He's this uh, gritty hard boiled detective. Um, and I know you have your own kind of way of thinking about how you would have done the story. Um, yeah. But I still think personally, if this is the route you're going to go, uh, that he is a, an excellent cast, uh, a casting choice. I know you'd probably agree with that as well, um, even though you have your own kind of spin on it that you'd like to take. But I mean, like, it's still one of those things where it's just like, I think that if, you know, if you had to cast somebody at that time and give them a shot, you give Danny, you give it to Danny Glover and he kills it. He does his best. And you can see that energy throughout the film, especially, I think he really sells, helps sell the relationship he has with these other actors, especially with, uh, you know, like Ruben and Maria, even Bill Paxton to a, a certain extent. I think even to him to probably the best extent, because he is that outsider coming into this group. And you see that from right off the rip, but you see, uh, and he does such a great job, Danny Glover, of showing uh, him gaining his respect as they yeah. continue on with this case. And you really see how ripped up he is every time one of his team uh, gets crossed up or diced up by this predator. And yeah. I mean, really when Jerry goes, it's kind of this and Leona's injured. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back in the fullest extent where he doesn't care where the hell he ends up. He doesn't care about the Heights thing. He doesn't care about any of that shit. He is going to chase this thing down and kill this man. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think Pill Paxton really does drive home uh, that likable character. Uh, again, my biggest critique is we don't get enough time. But I think Bill Paxton uh, uses his time wisely here because he just bec he comes off as such a likable guy that you really feel for him. And you find that relationship between him um, and Harrigan 
so real, you know. So it's like, um, even though it's only limited time, it they they the cast makes it worth it. I feel. No, I agree. But I think we'll probably move on from cast now, unless you have anything else you want to to point out or anything. I think we. No, I don't think so. I think you covered it, but we covered a great deal of it uh, in our little synopsis there. But uh, that makes us into uh, creatures features. Gotta be fucking kidding. <laughs> Gotta love it. Scary Every time, Every time I see that clip, I'm just reminded of how much I love that fucking movie. Um, but yeah, going into this, um, like I said earlier, we do have a slightly different looking predator here. Um, obviously, you know, all of the the same expectations are there when it comes to it. So like you're talking about, um, you know, uh, the mandibles, everything's still there, but he's a different color. He's got a little bit of a different build to him, which is interesting for him being, you know, played by the same actor. Yeah. Um but you still see those subtle differences. You still see not only in the way he's presented, but the way that he acts, as you said, he's a little bit more of a clumsier predator. So, you know, like I think all in all you're, uh, you're getting, you know, just a different performance and a different take. And I, I think that's important because they really could have just taken the other predator out of there and thrown him into this movie and then called it a day. But no, there was an attempt there at least. And I think you got to give a lot of that to, um, the directors, the writers, the creators behind it, as well as uh, Stan Winston returning for this one again. Obviously, yeah. uh, Predator is one of his babies. Um, he does love that creature a lot. Um, so, you know, having the great Stan Winston come back is huge. I think that the Predator looks better in the first movie. Uh, we do see a lot more of this one. Um, but when we get to that close up, when he's taken off the mask for the first time, just something about him just looks a little, little, little funky in my opinion, but uh, still, I think that it's, it's still serviceable. It's still, we, we don't get necessarily as wonky and weird as we get into like AVP as we get into those ones where the predators are looking real bulky and buff and just kind of like, okay, this isn't really predator. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and, and I think that comes with, um, like that initial design for the initial predator in the original film where it's like, I, I feel like they didn't have everything hammered out there in terms of the mechanics and stuff like that. So um, I know um, Kevin Peter Hall, right? That's his name. Mm -hmm. uh, had an issue in terms of being able to see correctly out of it. So they don't really have the schematics all lined up for that one. So I feel like in that terms, you kind of keep, you don't do those extreme close up shots. And I think that's a better way to take it where it's like, I feel like especially starting in predator two and especially in those later films where they kind of really harness those, the schematics in terms of uh, making the mechanics move and all that. And they're like, well, let's take advantage of that and really open this up and get those extreme, ex extreme close-ups um, to kind of like really show this. And I don't think you need that with the predator because uh, it almost less is more. You know, so mm. it's like you don't really want to focus. You don't want to get every nook and cranny there. You want to stay a little farther away and not really see how everything opens up and, and how everything works. It's like, uh, especially those shots of where he's like face to face with him, where he says, you ugly motherfucker, or where he's hanging off the, the building. I think it's way too close and it almost looks cartoonish a little bit. That's about um, the sign that I, that, that's about the part that I was discussing when I was saying yeah. it looks a little wonky to me. Yeah, that's always the like, one that sticks out in my mind. It's like, I don't think we need that close up of it, but I do like that they kind of went out of their way to make this one um, its own feeling because I think they had said this is kind of a different kind of, this is predator, but it's like, oh, a human being never really looks the same as another human being. So they all have slight differences and stuff like that. So <clears throat> this one does feel unique. They really did go out of the way to make it feel unique with the coloring um, I like the addition of the little trinkets and skulls and things that they've added to this one. It really feels different. It feels, I guess you'd say a little more modern than the jungle hunter where it's like, yeah. 
you know, he's probably been living there um, a little bit. So he's got like necklaces, bracelets, things like little, little trophies. trophies that he's yeah. Yep. So it's like, um, I, I like that they added that it's making him feel like his own, you know, it's like, um, you know, I, I can say maybe the the jungle hunter feels like some of the ones that we see in predators and AVP set, feel pretty much the same where I th- I feel like the city hunter uh, from predator two feels like unique of its own. I would say. Mm. No, I would agree. Um, but overall, I mean, special effects wise, the predator is really the, the taking center stage here, but I think we've highlighted it a lot. I think the blood and the gore uh, that they they implement in this film is really great. It's really intense. Um, they really do play it up well. I mean, the movie got an NC-17 for a reason. Yeah. Uh, granted, I mean, you know, the ratings board and all that, that's all semantics and politics at the end of the day, so it really doesn't matter. Um, but I would say that, like, they they definitely, they don't shy away. Uh, they they definitely take what we saw in the first film and they show you what happens when a predator has to deal with not only, you know, six guys in a jungle, what happens if he's dealing with, you know, hundreds of people in a city. So yeah. they really play into that well. And I think that it all works really well. I mean, give the whole special effects team props. I mean, obviously, um, this franchise, say what you will, is basically hinging on these special effects being sold and making sure that we believe that this predator is real. I think that it's another thing that you lose a lot of when you get down to these later films, especially the predator. Um, Because I mean, although they have a lot of practical effects, I think that they look even worse Uh, in that film. I think they don't light them correctly. Um, And then as you get into that CG with that big fucking, what is he? The alpha predator or whatever. Um, Oh yeah. Oh my God. I can't believe you had to rewatch that recently. Like you poor boy. I don't know what's so going sorry. on. Sorry, man. I don't know what my life's about. But uh, <laughs> but uh, going into um, just real quick as you were talking about those, the like the aftermath scenes with the blood, where it's like, um, sometimes those types of scenes can feel almost gratuitous if you don't walk that fine line of the use of blood. I mean, you can probably look up uh, some modern films on Shutter or something like that and be like, you went a little overboard there and it, it kind of takes you out where here, I feel like they walk that fine line where it just seems like you are just in a slaughterhouse, but it doesn't feel over the top. You know, these guys aren't caked in blood. It's on the walls and things like that. It really makes it, it, it adds a lot to the set design. Um, so, and it makes it feel like real. So I, I think predator two walks that fine line and it really adds a lot to that story. Um, and then kind of going into, uh, I know we talked about the weaponry. Um, I think here they used it to perfection. Yeah, I mean mm-hmm. they really took advantage to open up that world. Um, that the rep weaponry, the the extra tools that he uses um, to heal himself. You know, all those are fine additions that we did not see in that original uh, Predator film. So it really opens up. Uh, they really made use of that stuff to really tell a story to kind of get um, that otherworldly feel and kind of show us what exactly uh what the predator has at his disposal so i really like those additions here um those it makes again predator 2 say what you want about it really opens up the world and makes it this is probably i would say probably the most unique film out of the entire franchise could so definitely far. agree as we've seen but uh all right i think i'm gonna throw us into our final segment here our little wrap up the close up here Let's talk the final thoughts with our last segment. The check is in the mail. Just listen to the old pork chop express and take his advice on a dark and stormy night, all right? When some wild-eyed eight-foot tall maniac grabs your neck, taps the back of your favorite head up against a barroom wall, and he looks you crooked in the eye, and he asks you if you've paid your dues. Well, you just stare that big sucker right back in the eye, and you remember what old Jack Burton always says at a time like that. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir. The check is in the mail. Love it. Kurt Russell. He's a, he's a staple here. Hope to get him on the show one day. That'd be amazing. Not uh, Patrick Swayze. Maybe Kurt Russell should have been in Predator too. Shut your mouth, you dirty whore. That now you've you've ruined it. Now I hate this movie. Kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, all righty. So with this being our final segment, as we get into this, is kind of where we discuss more uh the the legacy and you know kind of where the film holds with us and just overall like kind of our final thoughts and ratings 
Um, I do want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, a few things that I didn't really find a good spot to fit these in during our long, looks like almost two and a half hour discussion. Uh, you think we'll I would get have found by the end of this? But uh, I want to discuss that um, one of the takes we kind of talked about it. How Dutch was supposed to play that Peter Keys role at one point in one version of the script. Um, the version that I believe is canon that I'm reading from here is in the backstory explaining Dutch, the hero of the first film, his absence from the sequel. Keyes had learned that Dutch's encounter with the predator and tracked him down to a hospital. Dutch was being treated for radiation sickness, though are thought to be a result of exposure to the predator's self-destruct device. After hearing Dutch's account of the events, Keyes and the OWLF team were sent to the jungle to investigate and studied the site where the predator detonated the device. They found evidence of a spaceship launch in the jungle, and the deceased predator's ship had automatically returned to the predator's homeworld. Dutch later escaped from the hospital and vanished, and Keyes believed he was still alive and still out there. So I think that's kind of where they left it off with Cannon. Um, yeah. so far, I think that's where we can kind of leave it because it's kind of up in the air, really what goes on with Dutch. And I mean, with this one, they kind of really never tell you what happens with Harrigan. You can only kind of just assume and make up. They may have gone into it in comics. I could not find anything. I don't know if you found anything in your research about Harrigan. Um, no. I guess that kind of plays into the current reception at the time of this film. I think nowadays you get a lot more content with Harrigan. Uh, you'd like to see where he comes up and pops up later on down the road. Um, I mean, for God's sakes, he probably could have popped up in fucking uh, Pred the Predator at some point. Yeah. Like, they tried to get everybody in that damn movie. They tried to get fucking Ripley in that movie. Um, you know, which was a mess in and of itself. But the other point that I wanted to kind of fall into here, uh, one of the most interesting follow-ups, I would say, was a 1996 comet comic called Predator... 1718. Now, this is going off of the pistol that was given to Harrigan at the end of the film by a predator that is known by a few as the Golden Angel. Um, so he is you you have an older NECA of that predator, don't you? Yeah, and I believe he's called Grayback at that point. Grayback, yeah, he has a couple different names. So Grayback the golden angel, um, all of that is just kind of how they, they know him as. Um, but in this comic, we actually follow the, the guy, the captain, the guy who was named, who has his name etched in on the pistol, uh, called Raphael Adelini. And the story is pretty interesting. I think it really expands on this and it really, again, adds to that predator lore and why I think the legacy of this franchise, this character, and even this movie in general is so important and why they really need to stick to the source material or at least look back on it when thinking about making future Predator movies because I think this is some of the best stuff you're going to get because this is a really cool story. And I'd love to see this come onto uh, the screen. So for a brief synopsis, and I encourage anybody to look up uh, a video by Alien Theory, he just released it a couple days ago as of this recording. I'll be putting it up on Twitter here after we release this video. So keep an eye out on our Twitter for that. Um, but yeah, he goes over all of this. There's a couple other YouTubers that also go deep into this that I'll, I'll link as well. But dropping anchor at an island in, uh, in Guinea, I think it is. I think I, I misspoke. I think I mistyped this. But uh, in 1718, Captain Raphael Adelini, leader of a small band of pirates, is suddenly faced with mutiny over a stolen case of gold, which was destined for a church. Adelini wanted the gold returned, much to the anger of his crew who turned against him. In the, fo in a, in the following battle, a watching predator joins the fray and fight back to back with Adelini, attacking the rebellion crew, uh, the rebellious crew, with an extendable sword in the cinematic, in the climactic and cinematic scene. With the crew dead and the, pred uh, and the predator and Adelini about to battle, mano y mano, the captain is shot in the back by a surviving crew member who was hiding, 
Denied his trophy, the Predator angrily blasts the crew member. With his dying breath, Adelini whispers, take it, to the Predator. Uh, throwing his beautifully engraved pistol with Adelini dead, the Predator takes a moment to think about what happened, and with some curious respect, leaves the dead captain his extendable sword, burying him in the sand. When he leaves the sword, he then announces the, the famous words, take it. So, in my eyes, they took just a small scene from Predator 2 with this Predator, Greyback, the Golden Angel, whatever you want to call him, and they put this whole backstory behind him and showed you that, like, they've been around for hundreds of years. This is not their first rodeo. And why I thought this was important to highlight is because we're going into Prey. We're going into this movie that takes place years ago. We've never seen a Predator movie take place this far back. We've seen it in comics. And I think that it's totally interesting. I think that it's definitely the way I want to see this franchise going. I think it excites me and it gets me there. And this is just a really great story to show why I think it'll work. Um, I think that it's really cool that they were able to kind of bring this full circle with them saying, take it. And it really adds more to that history and that lore. And it shows um, just how the Predators operate, how their code of honor has been around forever. They're always following it, and they always have a way of doing it. And that at the end of Predator 2, it further cements that, you know, with Harrigan killing that Predator, he has gained the respect and he has earned his life uh, in the eyes of the Predators. So I thought it was pretty interesting. It was a big part of what I wanted to highlight here. Um, I feel like maybe legacy and rating is a great spot for me because personally, I, I love Predator 2 for all its flaws, for all the things that it could have been with, you know, you bringing up the script, uh, the more character stuff we could have gotten. I still enjoy this movie. I still think it's worth checking out. And I love that this seems to be a big jumping off point for a lot of the lore and where Predator has gone or could have gone. Yeah. Um, I think if we follow a little closer to the ideas and what they were able to pull from Predator 2 and what they introduced when we go into further Predator movies, I think we'll be better for it. Yeah, um, I, that comic is is very intriguing. Um, I I love I love all the extra backstory that a lot of um, the comics and just fans in general put to the lore. Um, I, we have so many different things to bring up, and I may be drawing a connection that could not be there, especially in hindsight that um, it, that the comic was created post uh, script here, but. One of the things that I did want to bring up, and it's a very intriguing kind of parallel there, where in that comic, the uh, Predator was almost deprived of his his kill or his trophy in a sense. Um, so he was given the the pistol uh, as a, I don't know, parting gift uh, uh, in a sense. Whereas in the original script, um, Harrigan does not kill that Predator. He injures him horribly, obviously, with that same uh same you know with the smart disc right into the midsection as the lost predators appear uh and they decide to drag him off um the interpredator and as they're dragging him off the interpredator puts his arms in the air and the elder predator uh cuts off his head um yep. so it's very intriguing to think that you know that in a sense could have also been the parting gift since harrigan would have been deprived of his trophy in, in the predator's eyes. So you kind of give him that pistol just like Grayback would have, would have been given that pistol um, from Andalini. So I, I think that would be an interesting parallel to kind of, kind of draw there. But I do love that the, the extra, um, extra lore that we, we are given with these comics. It's something that I know that I believe in seeing there in October, or November, they are re-releasing the omnibus uh, for volume one of, uh, the Predator comic, and I'm very intrigued on picking that up because it's hard to kind of come by nowadays. I think there are four of them. Um, I really want to dive into that because there is so much lore and legacy left on the table here, especially it, it's amazing to think um, that we did not see a film from uh, Predator 2 to AVP. There's such a giant gap there when there's so much uh, to kind of explore, uh, whether it works or it doesn't for some fans, I don't know, but um, this is like uh, this film or this franchise is so ripe in terms of legacy because 
there's so much you can get out of it. There's so much to do here. Uh, one of the things I didn't really get to um, touch on was the Leona character in me kind of believing that um, I think she should have been the main focus here. Um, you know, if you're not going to be able to get Arnie um, to try and put any other action star in there in the 90s, I don't think was going to work because it was going to feel less than. Um, so maybe you just go the opposite route and kind of do a female lead. And I think it would have been interesting to kind of deal with the pregnancy angle in a sense that the predator cannot kill Leona because she is pregnant and is against this code. So she's kind of messing with all his trophies in a sense and kind of injecting herself in these situations. And he knows he can't do anything. I think it may have been even more interesting to have her lose the baby halfway through and to know that uh, the all bets are off at that point. Uh, I mean, you're playing with a lot of themes that probably were never really touched on, especially in 1990, 1990. So it's like um, maybe there's a lot there to kind of explore. So I think that would have been interesting to kind of just uh, go with the female lead, especially in 1990, and, you know, explore those things that we really did not get to explore with all the male leads, um, you know, throughout the, the 80s action. I agree. But, yeah, I think uh, I think we've about run our course here with Predator 2. Do you have any closing thoughts here, Luke? Um, I do enjoy Predator 2, honestly. Um, you know, going back, I did enjoy this deep dive here because, again, it re. I, my love for for Predator is infinite. Uh, it it's spanned across probably uh, twenty years, I would say already. So, you know, but it's like one of those things where when you're focusing on so many other things, it kind of goes dormant for a little bit. So when you have this time to kind of just spend in the in, in the Predator universe and kind of explore um, and have that excuse to, uh, I absolutely love it. So it's like you know preparing for this predator two podcast was just absolutely lovely for me because I love playing in this space so much. Um, and it gets you thinking creatively of where you can go and the predator or prey on her on the horizon right now. I mean, it's a great time to be a predator fan. The positive reviews are really getting me excited here. So overall predator two explored the lore. I think it, it did a uh, sufficient job to do it. It gets you excited watching it. It also gets you excited of what could have come. Uh, but overall, I enjoy the film. I will be, I've rewatched it in the past 20 years, and for the next 20 years, I will definitely be re rewatching it. I agree 100%. I thoroughly enjoy this movie. I thought that it was a pretty worthy sequel to me, even though as we've gone deeper into it, we kind of could have seen what it could have been, the potential that it had. I still think that what we got, uh, even if it's more nostalgia based to me, um, it's still one it's of those things where ride. it's like, it is, it's something that I appreciate. I like, even though, uh, like we've said, there are some shortcomings when it comes to the characters where they could have gone. I still think it's just a lot of fun. I think that it, it, it does so much with the predator itself and adds to the lore and, uh, gives you a lot to think on. And obviously two hours and almost 40 minutes worth of stuff to chew on. Uh, as we should. And we could probably talk another hour. Oh, honest. I mean, yeah, there's still so much that I think that we could have touched on. I mean, even just in the franchise alone, I, I think even with the first one, <laughs> that's there's probably another close to three hours on that film alone oh, yeah. that we could discuss. But I am intrigued. I'm excited for Prey. I don't think it's any bit of a secret that we're both looking forward to it. Um, you know, but even if Prey disappoints, and let's say that, you know, people are being a little kinder to it than maybe we will be because being pretty deep Predator fans, there are expectations. And especially with how things have gone recently in the few last few years, I think that, you know, those expectations and my reservations are, are duly warranted. Um, but even if the movie doesn't turn out to, to be the next great Predator movie for me, I think that the reward of going back and deep diving into this film and getting to really see what could have transpired, what happened, why it came out the way it did, and just getting to talk about it and gush about Predator 2 is more than enough for me to say that this was definitely an awesome time to be a Predator fan. I can't agree more, Dylan. But yeah, I guess that about wraps us up there, guys. So I'm going to switch us back over here, bring us back to the format, 
and uh, we'll do our little outro here as always. So if you guys want to keep up with us, always definitely leave a comment down below. Let us know what you guys think of Predator 2. Uh, if you guys are Predator fans, obviously if you are, I don't think you, if you weren't, I don't think you'd be listening to this. But uh, yeah, does this make you think differently about Predator 2? Does this make you, you feel a little bit different? Is this one of the best sequels or is this just another, you know, crappy one to throw in the bin uh, like we've gotten with these later ones. Let us know. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Splattercast Pod, where you can keep up with us. Where, Like we said, we'll be posting probably a couple of maybe some articles. I know I'll be posting some links to some videos uh, going well. forward here this week. Just There's to, so many out there. Yeah, to show you kind of some of the research that we got and uh, to what we looked into to kind of pull some of this up. If you want to go a little deeper into Predator 2. Um, as well as keep an eye out for our review of Prey. We will be getting that out to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, it does come out on a Friday, so I know we both work, but we are going to do our best to get that out to you. Crossing my fingers, maybe it drops a little earlier on Thursday night. Maybe we can get it done. I'll go to work tired for you guys. I will. Yeah, but me too. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where I'm just hoping the movie it delivers. But yeah, yeah, follow us at Splattercast Pod. And if you want to check out our older episodes, you can find them on YouTube here, as well as on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Music, Spotify, and uh, Amazon Music. I almost said Spotify Music. Um, but yeah, I guess that about wraps us up for here, guys. So uh, unless you have anything else, Luke, uh, about time to, to end this bitch. Exactly. Well, until <laughs> next time, I'm Luke Janesco. And I'm Dylan Newell. And remember, we all go a little mad sometimes. Yeah.